Today is the 26th of September 2019 and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Richard Whitney. Richard, I'm delighted to welcome you to School Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. Thank you for taking the time to share your life story today. Thank you for asking me. I'm very honoured. Fantastic, Richard. Well, let's begin from the start. Dr. Richard Whitney, you were born during 1946 in Vermont, New England. You go by the title of American painter, author, and educator. Town and Country Magazine has named you one of the top 12 portrait painters in America. Fine Art Connoisseur has called you one of the giants of the field of figurative painting. I'm curious to learn more about your beginnings. Can you recall the era in which you grew up in and explain a little about your childhood? Uh, yes, I can. Um, I was, uh, as, I, as you mentioned, I was born in Burlington, Vermont. I was put up for adoption shortly after I was born. And my adopted parents who found me, Roland and Harriet Whitney, were looking for, were in their mid 40s when they decided to have a child, to adopt a child. And my father was very good friends with the head of the adoption agency in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So he uh, talked to this person and said, you know, since we're only going to have one child, we really would like an accept someone with an exceptional background if you can find it. So they spent two years looking for me. And when they found me, they understood that I came from a family of artists and missionaries going back many generations and that my birth mother was very distinguished in the art field. So they adopted me. At, uh, at about six months, I spent the first few months in a hospital with a fractured skull. Okay. So, okay. so it was kind of a traumatic uh, start to my life. But they adopted me at an early age, and within a few days after I was living with them, I came out of my shell, and I laughed, and I cried, and I became a human being again instead of repressed as I was. So anyway, my both my parents were very interested in the arts and in music. Both, both my parents played a piano in, in vaudeville. My dad uh, uh, was an orchestra leader, the Whitney Orchestra at Dartmouth College. And he, his orchestra, the money he earned from it, uh, enabled him to finance his education at Dartmouth College. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so they were both interested in music and my mother was an amateur painter. She had painted, wanted to paint all her life, uh, but never really had the opportunity to study painting. Her sister went to the museum school, but her sister never did anything with painting, but the parents are too poor to send my mother to, to school. So she studied privately here in Keene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they knew that I was came from an exceptional background, so they... Uh, music was always around in a house, you know, listening to classical music and also uh, beautiful paintings on the walls. And uh, that's how I started. And, and then you can start from there. Your next question. Sure. sure. So, uh, Richard, can I just clarify there for a moment? Uh, you, you mentioned that some of your family were missionaries. Uh, what church did they belong to? That I don't know. You sure. have no idea. No. Okay, sure. So as you mentioned, you have adopted parents who encourage your interest in art from an early age. In fact, as early as three years old, your mother could see that you were creatively gifted. When your mother Harriet handed you some crayons and a piece of paper, she wanted you to draw a house. However, you weren't interested in this subject. A week later, you showed your mother a drawing of a knight riding a horse before a background containing a castle and a sunset. From this point onwards, your parents could see that you had tremendous talent in art and encourage you to pursue it. Can you explain exactly how they encourage you? Well, first of all, when they saw that, my, my mother uh, saw the, paint, the drawing that I did and, and yelled out to my father, we have a genius in the house. <laughs> and then they went ahead and, it, and my mother and father uh, arranged for me to take private lessons. So I had very private private lessons very early in art from a, a, in the in the area. Sure. And I, they also started giving me piano lessons at an early age. Mm -hmm. So sure. they encouraged this from you know age five, age six, somewhere in there. Great. And and so that that was something that 
whatever I achieved as a student, it gave them great pleasure. Sure. And that was very important to me. Great. Yeah. And were you uh, an only child? Uh, was there any other adopted children that your parents took on? No. Okay. No. Now, during your elementary and high school years, you would continue to demonstrate your talent in drawing and painting, and this led you to winning several awards. At this early period of your life, what was your work looking like? It was always realistic uh, from the very beginning. Um, it, eventually, I would say it was more expressionistic. Uh, my hero at the time was Vincent van Gogh. Yeah. Um, I read his letters. I saw the movie. I saw, looked at everything I could of him. I loved the other impressionist painters, uh, you know, Gauguin and Cezanne and and Monet and so forth. Uh, so that was a great influence on me to start with. <clears throat> to start with. Sure. Mm -hmm. After high school, you attended the University of New Hampshire in 1964, where you majored in art and minored, minored in music as a classical pianist. During the summer of your freshman year at the University of New Hampshire, your mother encouraged you to attend private portrait classes with a knowledgeable painter of the tradition that she herself had been training with, whose name was Sidney Willis. Mr. Willis would ultimately provide you with a direct link to the great tradition of picture making, as he was a student of the late Robert Douglas Hunter, who in turn was a student of R. H. Eyes Gamel. Can you remember your initial meeting with Mr. Willis and some of the things you spoke about? Well, he, uh, my mother had told him ahead of time that I was quite gifted as an artist, so he was kind of prepared for me. And um, as you will, you will say later on, that uh, when I started a portrait, um, I was very pleased with it, and then he tore it apart and uh, repainted parts of it, and it made it better. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that struck deeply struck with me, is that when he touched my canvas and he made corrections in painting it was better than what I had sure so so that was very intriguing right and, and I knew that he was a very fine realist painter I you know at the time I understood that you know realism was just you know copying the thing that uh, uh, being an abstract painter was more difficult and so I figured you know I'm going to show this guy off you know I can do that sure yeah sure. and um, I was shocked when he told me that, you know, it wasn't good enough, you know, you need to do it this way or that way and so forth. And so I was very intrigued by it. Sure. Now, were those classes uh, in, in his home or were they in the University of New Hampshire? No, they were they were at Sharon Art Center, which oh, is a, okay. yeah, a separate in, institution. Okay, great. So when you initially saw Mr. Willis's work, how did you respond to it? Was it something that deeply resonated with you? Not really that much. I respected the skill involved. Okay. Yeah. And that was the thing. This this man really knew how to paint. Sure. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, as I said, I, I figured it was just something, you know, photography, you know, just it's just easy to copy the thing. I could do it myself, but I was interested in learning how to do it. Sure. And then, and then uh, um, when he started teaching me how to do it, it was it became a real challenge for me and something I loved. I loved the challenge of it. Sure. Now, in regards to your training, what kind of uh, curriculum did Mr. Willis put you through? Well, main, mainly it was just uh, there was a portrait painting class. So there was the model up in front, and you had to sort of sketch sketch in the uh, outside shape of the model, and then on the canvas, and then uh, the uh, shadow area, the edge of the shadow going down the model and establishing the poor portions. And then he would start working in paint. And um, so that's what how I started the first the first class within two hours I I was had finished laying in the canvas. Wow. Paint. So you were yeah. painting in the first two hours? Correct. So he wasn't very big he wasn't very big on uh, spending time developing your drawing? No. Great. No. Great, fantastic. So how long was it in total that you spent with these part-time classes with Mr. Willis? Uh, it was just eight classes during the summer. I see, right. I understand that Mr. Willis taught mainly through demonstrating directly on students' work. 
which didn't help you learn to paint, but rather helped you learn to see. There is a fascinating quote from your first day as a student whereby Mr. Willis critiqued your work. You go on to state, quote, We had a live model. I worked on it for a couple of hours and I thought it was great. Then Sid came along and said that it stunk, grabbed the brushes out of my hand and repainted it. I was shocked. I was literally shaking, unquote. I imagine that this would have been an intimidating experience for a young man. At the same time, it would have been incredibly inspiring to see firsthand the capabilities that Mr. Willis had over the craft of painting. This is evidenced in another quote of yours whereby you state, quote, I was always thrilled when either Sid or Gamel would walk by and grab the charcoal or brush out of my hand, unquote. You mentioned that you were shocked when Mr. Willis would come by and correct your work. Now, were you shocked because of his forwardness during the critique or his abilities with the brush? Uh, I was shocked because it was really the first time anyone, anyone ever said that my work wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd won all kinds of regional and state awards at uh, UNH. I was the outstanding student, art student, the first year. Sure. So, you know, everybody said how great I was and wonderful I was. And then he says, you know, you, you're not good enough. Sure. And I was devastated by that first critique and literally shaking all, almost, almost all week long. Wow. And, and I said, I'm not going to let him do this. I'm going to go back and take another lesson with him, and I'm going to show that SOB that I know how to paint. Sure. And so I went back and did the best I could on the portrait. He came along, did the same sort of thing. He was more nice to me, but he took the brush out of my hand. He said, it should be like this. Mm -hmm. And that was when I said, you know, he's right. Sure. And then I, then I realized for the first time in my life, someone had actually taught me something about art. Right. And, and I, was, I was just fascinated by that. And then I would say, you know, uh, I, I, I admired Vincent van Gogh, and he would say, you know, oh, the guy, you know, he was a crazy man, you know, what about uh, Jerome, the great, Jer the great Jerome? So we would argue like that. Sure. Now, Richard, can I ask, regarding your high school art training, was that any good, or was it more just, uh, you know, explore your creativity kind of art? Well, it was very, Norma Safford was very encouraging. Um, I didn't learn much of anything from her. Mm -hmm. But whatever I did, she encouraged me, said that was great, you know, and so on and so forth. There was really no criticism about how, how to learn how to draw or paint what you're looking at. Sure, great. Now, I understand you would sometimes have arguments with Mr. Willis concerning painters that you liked, as you've already mentioned. At this point, you were quite fascinated by the work of Van Gogh rather than Jean Leon Jerome. Can you recall some of these debates and Mr. Willis's views on these issues? Well, he kept mentioning artists that I never had heard of, uh, people like Paxton and De Camp and uh, even John Singer Sargent. And I was just, you know, I was just so, um, what would be the word, um, it's so much in belief of what I had been taught that, you know, these were just uh, illustrators. They were not great painters. The great painters of the day were, you know, Van Gogh and the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists and Picasso. Everything I'd been taught up to that point, point was different than what he was telling me. Sure. And, and so I would question him over about that. And then he kind of, uh, uh, you know, criticized a painting, a painter that I particularly admired. And went back and forth for a while, and finally he he was frustrated frustrated with with me, and he showed me a book. Sure. Now your own views at the time would come to irritate Mr. Willis, and this led him to handing you a copy of Mr. Gamble's book, Twilight <clears throat> of Painting. Reading the book had a tremendous impact on you, as you've pre previously mentioned. It quote changed <clears throat> my life unquote. You further state your reaction to reading it as being, quote, thunderstruck, an emperor's new clothes kind of thing, because everything that I'd been led to believe about art during my high school and early college years was the exact opposite, unquote. Now, what exactly were you led to believe about art during your high school and early college years, and how were your eyes opened after reading Mr. Gamble's book? 
Well, as I mentioned, I had was you know inspired by people, uh, Picasso and Matisse and artists like that, uh, Cezanne and uh, Gauguin and so forth. And Mr. Gamble, in his book, introduced me to a number of 19th century masters that I'd never heard of, such as as uh, Bougereau, uh, Jerome, uh, uh, Alma Tadema, um, people like that. Uh, Lord Leighton would be another one. Mm-hmm. These, were, these were artists I'd never heard of. And then he talked about Paxton in the Boston School, and he talked about Mr. Gamble, and then he talked about his own training with, with Bob Hunter. Sure. So it was a whole new world that opened up to me. Great. Now, when you first read Twilight of Painting, was it one of those moments where you started reading a book and you couldn't stop until you finished it? Uh, yes, it was. Um Another unique aspect of Gamble's book was talking about all these great unknown 19th century painters and why they were great, great, and then showing the work of so-called 20th century masters with no comment. Sure. So you would, you would see a painting by Picasso with a, you know, a head with three eyes and so forth, and you were looking at uh, a Lord Leighton portrait, which was just astounding. You know, and it was clear that these artists of the 19th century that were uh, so wonderful and ignored, uh, you know, I, I wanted to learn how to paint like that. Sure. And all of a sudden, my whole outlook changed. And, you know, Sid Willis won me over and I said, I really want to learn how to paint like that. What do I do? Mm-hmm. Now, before we go any further, Richard, do you mind summarizing for listeners who may not be aware? exactly why R.H.I.'s Gamel is today remembered by traditional painters. Well, he was, he, his book, Twilight of Painting, uh, which he wrote in 1946, um, described the, the reasons for the collapse of classical painting, realistic painting, and the rise of modernism. And as I said, it was a book that uh, totally changed my viewpoint on those artists and Mr. Gamble, after he wrote that book, he was blackballed by museums in this country. He could not show his paintings anywhere. His career as an artist was literally destroyed. So he decided, you know, I've written about the collapse of painting and the reasons why, mainly bad instruction, and I should do something about it. So he decided that he would take on two or three students and and have them study with him for several years as they used to do hundreds of years ago in the apprenticeship apprenticeship system. And his students, people like Richard Lack, went on to teach literally a hundred of realist painters practicing in America today. And many of those artists also set up ateliers all over the world and are teaching hundreds of, of students themselves. So he was he was one of the few people who were teaching the craft of painting after it had become uh, unfashionable to do. Sure. Now, I understand Twilight of Painting affected you so much that you went on to write a letter to Mr. Gamble seeking his advice on receiving a thorough academic training. Do you still have this letter, and are you able to read it out? I, unfortunately, I don't have it. Um, at the time, I was a nobody. I, I was just a young person, you know, interested in learning about painting. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't send, save any of the letters that I wrote to Mr. Gamble. I wrote to him over a period of many years, probably 70 some odd letters, but I never saved them because I was not the, the great artist he was. He was an extraordinarily important person, and I thought it was something that I had to save. So I had no idea that I would become the artist that I've become. It was inconceivable. Sure. And uh, I'm, I, mis- I owe Mr. Gamble everything that I've become. I mean, it's, I had no idea I could paint what I do now. Wow. Yeah. Now, in that letter, were you just asking for general advice on how to go about se- seeking a, a sound training? Uh, yes, I did. And he actually said the best thing to do is to come down and see him. Sure. 
So as you just mentioned, Mr. Gamble eventually got back to you and invited you to visit him at his summer studios in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Are you able to give an in-depth description of the first meeting you had with Mr. Gamble? Well, I walked into the room and here is this very, very short man. Um, he was very pleasant, uh, shaked my hand, said hello. Uh, he said, uh, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from uh, Marlboro, New Hampshire. And he said, oh, you're from the hills. <laughs> and that attitude characterized his treatment of me over the next five years in the sense that since I was from the hills, clearly I was not sophisticated as the Boston painter was. And clearly I didn't know very much about art or music or culture or anything else. At least that was the assumption. So that was, uh, I realized that, that he'd already typecast me from the very beginning. And it turned out to be true. Sure. So sure. That, that was a, a kind of a tough way to begin, but then he... he uh, he looked at my work. He was extremely impressed, uh, especially with uh, my accurate eye. And uh, so he, he realized that I had a lot of talent. So he was he, he gave me the chance to he said, you know, you need to go. You need to finish your college education. It's very important. But you can study with me part time, visiting me weekends or during uh, school vacations and and you can study with me. You can study with me in Williamstown in the summer, next summer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, Richard, what was your age uh, around this time? Uh, I was nineteen. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what an incredible opportunity that must have been for you. Can you recall how you felt when Mr. Gamel made this offer to study with him? Well, it was it was a dream come true. The point is. All, all, these, all of my training with Mr. Gamble was going to be free. He paid for everything. Uh, he, he was very fortunate to be a, a multimillionaire. His, his grand, great grandfather was invented, the, established the Fruit of the Loom Corporation. And so he, he had the financial means, and he was very generous with his students in terms of providing the opportunity. And then, so it was a, I knew it was a great honor, and I was just thrilled. Sure. Now, I understand at the time, the university you were attending was heavily influenced by abstraction and expressionism. However, one of your professors, Mr. John Hatch, who was a student of the 20th century American painter Ernest Lee Major, was supportive of your interest in realist art and allowed you to focus on traditional painting. Professor Hatch decided to allow you to use the corner of his classroom as a small studio. Can you elaborate? Uh, yes. Uh, he agreed to let me do my drawings and uh, cast drawings and still life paintings and so forth, provided that I did all the assignments that he asked the rest of the class to do. Sure. So I had, a, I had a corner of the studio that was all mine for the next th three years that I, that I studied with Mr. Hatch. And... Uh, I, I would uh, uh, work on drawings from plastic casts or uh, still life um, objects. I went out landscape painting and, and showed him my landscapes. Um, I painted my fellow students as well. I used that corner of the classroom uh, for that purpose. Sure. Now, the exercises and the, the study that uh, Professor Hatch set for you, was that more modernist aligned? Uh, though that he was, uh, yes, w it was more of an ex the age of expressionism. So, uh, you know, your drawings had to be rather quick and very sketchy and very uh, flashy and so forth. Um, I would call it uh, very, very, very loose uh, expressionism sort of style or abstract painting also. Okay. At this point onwards... Your training with Mr. Gamble became frequent as you go on to quote, quote, from then on, from my sophomore through senior years at college, I would spend summers in Williamstown and go to Boston on the weekends and vacations to study with Gamble, unquote. It seems like this time in your life was a real breakthrough moment 
and I imagine it must have been like opening a floodgate of knowledge about the great tradition. Can you reminisce any interesting stories from this period of your life, particularly from your discussions with Mr. Gamel? Uh, my trips to Boston were very inspiring. Uh, I, the first time I went to Boston, um, he had me do a cast drawing, uh, a charcoal drawing from a plastic cast. He set up a, a young child's head. And I worked on it that afternoon and, and into the next day, next day, and he was extremely impressed. He said, I took the cast drawing like a duck to water. <laughs> so that so that was very good. I mean, he he was he he was right away impressed with my abilities and my um, facility. That things things came rather easy to me. So that that was very good. He also um, treated me to uh, the symphony, the opera, and so forth. He felt it was very important that I have a well-rounded education. Um, he apparently had forgotten that I minored in classical pu piano and I was, had been a pianist for 14 years. I never got a chance to play for him. He never really um, got it in his head that I had I'd studied music as well. So he always kind of looked toward me as though I was the young kid from New Hampshire that needed to be exposed to the world and not realizing that I knew a fair amount about it already. Sure. Now, Richard, do you mind just painting a picture, so to speak, of what the Fenway Studios in Boston was like? I mean, the environment itself, the studios, uh, who was around you? What other students were around you at the time? Uh, well, Sam Rose was the other student around me and... Um, Later on, Charles Cecil and uh, uh, David Curtis. Um, but Sam was with me the whole time. He had been with Gamble for several years. Um, probably one of the most talented people I've ever met. He was a genius. And um, I admired him very, very much for a long period of time. And, and so it was interesting to see Sam work on a painting for day after day, week after week. It was quite quite inspiring to see how much effort he put into things. Sure. And so that so that was a great lesson. Um, when when I the time I spent in Boston, we spent a lot of time when in the studio drawing from figure models and so forth, or doing still life painting that winter and you know, into the following spring. I see. I see. Now, another aspect of Mr. Gamble's teaching methods, which I have come, uh, which I've heard from other students, is that he wanted his students to have a well-rounded education. And you've touched on this a little bit in your previous <clears throat> answer. He was not simply interested in only teaching them how to paint. He wanted to educate their minds and expose them to a broader cultural program as well. To that end, he often took his students to the opera and classical concerts, as well as providing them with a library card so they could have access to public books. There were even a few students whom he sent to Harvard in order to help them learn to write better. Was this approach to improving your general education something which you experienced with Mr. Gamel? As I understand, he did recommend for you to enroll in an English literature course whilst at university. Uh, yes, it was. He... he uh... Uh, thought that I should, you know, know more about Shakespeare uh, and other major literary figures. Um, as I said, he, I was grateful, very grateful that he took me to the opera. Or that Sam and I would go to the opera sometimes, two two different performances the same weekend. It was sort of a sometimes an overload, but that Mr. Gamble took advantage of opportunities when they came as far as uh, performers who uh, came to Boston. Uh, so it was a great privilege, and all of this was free. And that was wonderful, uh, because you know I would not have been able to afford that kind of instruction on my own. Sure. Now, going back to the University of New Hampshire for, for a moment, can you provide a summary of your university years and recall any interesting stories of what it was like to be a traditionally aligned art student in an opposing environment. 
I was sort of the realist in the corner. Uh, <laughs> virtually, virtually everybody else were abstract painters, or I would say sort of Matisse type expressionist realist painters. Uh, no more realistic than that. Um, so it was, it was interesting. Other professors would kind of laugh, make fun of me. Um, but uh, by that time, I I was already sold on wanting to learn how to paint. So I, it didn't really bother me that much. I, and uh, uh, the work that I did for Professor Hatch, it, it was always A plus, A, A plus work anyway. Uh, so it was not a problem for me to to do the work the university assigned to me and then to do my own work. Um, I remember, uh, yeah, go, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I go out landscape painting. I, I painted out in fall that year and, and other years while I was in school. And so I brought in, showed a lot of those works also, but, uh, here again, no one else in the class was doing anything like it. Sure. Now, I understand you used to pay your classmates $5 to paint their portrait. As a reward, you would give them the painting once complete. Did you find this practice to be helpful to your development as a painter? Uh, absolutely, because uh, here again, I would get uh, an occasional lesson in portraiture from life from Mr. Gamble, um during the year, but uh, not until summers were did I have an opportunity to paint with a model full time. So in the meantime, I would practice painting from a model by hire, hiring kids to pose for, for paintings that I did of them. And I gradually got better and better at it and understood more and more how to do it. So I was taking the instruction that Mr. Gamble gave me and practicing my skill and improving my skill as a result. Great. Mr. Gemmell's role to his students simply, simply consisted of, quote, opening windows and turning on lights, unquote. I understand the motto for his studio was, quote, whole hog or nothing, unquote. Can you explain exactly what Mr. Gemmell meant by these sayings? Well, of course, opening windows and turning on lights. Uh, he, he said the learning to see realistically and be able to paint realistically is like uh, uh, looking using your eyes and your eyes have thousands of scales over their eyes that prevent you from really seeing what the thing looks like and what the colors really are like. And as you draw and you develop your skill at drawing and you, you begin, begin to see the shape, shapes of nature as they really are, scales come off your eyes and they crash on the floor. Mm. So he would, he would always say that, you know, you know, oh yes, you've, you've improved that. I hear crashing of the scales on the floor. Sure. Uh, in terms of whole hog or nothing, exactly. Uh, you either give it complete seriousness and you do your best or you get out. It is a, for example, you had to report to a studio at 8.30 in the morning. Not 8.25, not 8.35. <laughs> <laughs> if you came to a studio about 8.40, you were out the door. Wow. Period. 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 There was no, he, he didn't put up with any kind of uh, lackadaisical behavior. Um, it was it was funny sometimes to see a student come in the morning and leave in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was a very, very rigid training. But I, but I appreciated that as a, the rigidity. As I said, I was fascinating with, fascinated with the difficulty of painting and I and the skill involved and the time and effort it took I, I always felt that it <clears throat> that it, nothing is really uh, that great or wonderful unless it's it's something that's been labored on over a long period of time and takes great effort and skill to do that sure now, you have mentioned that your training with Mr. Gamble began with cast drawing and charcoal. I understand that you focused on, quote, starts and grabbing the essentials, unquote, rather than creating a highly finished rendering of the cast. The cast that Mr. Gamble had you work on were 
relatively simple in their design and, quote, did not have a lot of Greek curls, unquote. Can you describe what Mr. Gamble's method of cast drawing involved? Well, first of all, it, it was sight size. In other words, you had the plaster cast, and directly beside the plaster cast, you had your, your easel with your drawing board and paper on the drawing board. And you would step back, oh, about three and a half times the greatest dimension of the paper, maybe about eight or ten feet. And that from that viewing point, you get to see the cast and your paper in the same view. Yes. So it's, it's, so it's very, very easy then to line up with a ruler exactly where the height of a cast is and the base of the cast. It's easy to get measurements, and it's very easy to see when you've got something wrong. It either looks like the thing or it doesn't. Sure. Now... Uh, just in regards to the medium that Mr. Gamble favored when drawing casts, was he uh, training you with charcoal or was it pencil? Um, cast drawing would be for uh, charcoal. Um, uh, he did not do cast drawing with even pencil. Sure. We did, we did pencil line drawings of nude models, and we also did charcoal drawings. Uh, he would do... Pencil drawings are basically line drawings. In other words, you concentrate on the contour of the form mm -hmm. and you lightly shade the shadow areas. Um, charcoal drawings were more like mass drawings. You're interested in the big light and dark shapes of the model. That's what you focus on. Right. And what you try to do, what a painter tries to do is to try to have sensitive, great sensitivity to the outside shape of the form and also to be able to state the big masses of the form simply simply and directly. Sure. So when you were working with charcoal, I'm assuming that you went directly into mass drawing and never would start with an outline? Correct. Well, sure. you start with an outline. You start with an outline, but then you get right into the masses. Right, right. Regarding your training with Mr. Gamble, you go on to explain, quote, we did a lot of figure drawing, pencil drawing, and charcoal from the live model as well, unquote. How did drawing from the live fit into your overall training? Well, many, many times, you know, as you, we, we did models, numerous sketches of models. Um, we did not spend weeks or months on a single figure or a single cast drawing. He wanted us to try to grab the essential forms early on, which I was able to do. And um, just over a period of time, you just got better and better at it. I learned more drawing casts than I learned doing anything else, actually. Uh, my skill greatly improved within a few months of cast drawing. And so when I, when I drew from life, it wasn't as difficult as it might have been. Sure. So was the studio set up in such a way that you started with casts in the morning and the afternoons were dedicated to figure drawing? Well, I was oftentimes cast drawing or figure, figure drawing in the morning, cast drawing in the afternoon, or, or portrait painting or still light painting in the afternoon. It, it varied. Sure. Uh, oftentimes when the model was able to when the, we were able to get a model and when the model was able to come. Right. Mr. Gamble's approach to painting was to begin immediately, as we learn from the following quote. Quote, learn how to pick up a brush as soon as possible. Remember, Sergeant's mother used to have him go out and do a sketch a day. A few years of that and he learned how to masterfully manipulate paint, unquote. This approach seems to be counterintuitive today, as the majority of contemporary ateliers and academies have students drawing for at least a year before they are allowed to begin painting. What is your opinion on this issue? As I said, I think uh, it's important to learn how to handle the paintbrush as soon as possible uh, because ultimately you're going to have to struggle to learn how to paint with a paintbrush loaded with paint. Uh, it's not like using a pencil or a fine, a fine pencil point or a charcoal point. This is a big glob of paint on a brush and how do you make it as delicate as a pencil line is difficult to do so <clears throat> so learning to um, 
start painting very soon was very important. Uh, you learn how to draw doing cast drawings. You learn how to paint and manipulate oil paint doing still life. So because it didn't move and yeah. it simple simple sorts of element of objects. Sure. And, and so you can tell most of these students that come from the ateliers when you look at their paintings, they're very very polished. Mm almost labored yes um uh, oftentimes brown lacking mm. in color and uh, it's more like a tinted drawing mm. and, and that's the issue and that's the problem i think the majority of contemporary ateliers are making a mistake by not having their students start painting right away i think my experience has been it took me quite a long time to be feel comfortable using a brush to learn how to manipulate paint, how to, especially how to do edges. And if you wait a year or so before you start to paint, I think you get more into the habit of kind of filling in a drawing. Mm. Um, so it, it looks more like it's cold. It looks more photographic, shall we say, rather than painterly. Um, there's a tendency to just do a line drawing and very carefully fill it in. Uh, it's very admirable in that in that respect, but it lacks a certain vitality in life, which you do get when you paint directly from life uh, right from the beginning. I think you have a better sense of being able to handle the brush, mm. and I think it, I think it shows later on. Sure. Now, Richard, do you believe it's necessary to take uh, the cast drawing to the degree of finish that they're in uh, in, in today's contemporary ateliers? Uh, that, that, I think, is a, a very good question. Yes, I admire students that will spend five or six months on a cast drawing a week learning how to shade the background of the charcoal paper in a perfect tone. One reason it takes them that long is because today's charcoal paper is not what the masters used. It's filled with little bumps and ridges. Mm. And Mr. Gamble said in the old days you could use charcoal and you could make a beautiful smooth tone with just a smear of your thumb. Wow. Yeah, but those, those days are gone because the paper the material is inferior. So I do understand... And to some extent, why the ateliers have their students do a drawing for that long time to be able to perfect it. However, spending weeks and months on one thing, I think, also tends to dull, dull and deaden the student. Mm. Yeah. Over a period of time, I think it may lead to them to be very discouraged when they got, get out in the world and try to make a living as an artist. Sure. And they, sure. and they discover the world is totally different than what it was in the atelier. I think it, it makes a lot of them very discouraged. Mm. I think it kind of kills their uh, uh, creativity, I would say, as well. Sure, sure. And it gives them a false sense of what it's like in the real world. We, we Studying with Mr. Gamble was learning the way a rich man learns how to paint. Mm. Mr. Gamble could do whatever he wanted. He could paint whatever he wanted. He could spend as much time as he wanted on anything. When you get out in the real world and try to make a living as an artist, sometimes you get a commission that you have really no interest in doing, but you have to feed your wife and family. You have to do something. Yeah. And so you, in order to survive, you have to be able to manage both be almost schizophrenic. Mm. You learn how to, uh, shall we say, do things quickly so that you know, Rembrandt, Rembrandt would used to say, always keep the pot boiling. Sargent would whack out paintings right and left very quickly. A lot of them weren't, weren't very good, but some of them were extremely masterful and have not been equaled. Uh, part of part of that is because he produced a lot of work, rather than just a very limited amount. Uh, so I, I think it's important to be productive, yeah, and especially if you're trying to make a living. Um, 
galleries are much more interested in you if you can paint something very quickly than if you have to spend weeks and months on it. I mean, after all, if if they if you can paint it quickly, they can make more money on you. Sure, sure. Now, in, in regards yeah, to regards. cast painting, uh, Richard, uh, Mr. Gamble, would he have you paint the cast in grisaille or uh, was it using a color palette? Uh, using a color palette um, so that you could try to get some of the different tones of white, shall we say, some of the different colors of white. Sure. Uh, a grisaille is, that's, yes, it's useful if you have difficulty drawing and you really have to separate the process into two or three separate things. One being establishing the big shapes in grisaille and then going over it with colors later on. Um, I found that the grisaille uh, approach interferes with the purity of the colors that you put on later on. That grisaille brown underpainting ekes its way into your your painting. I mean, it just it affects it. Mm. And when I started doing portraits, and I started with doing a grisaille underpainting and then a, over it, a uh, painting in full color, I had trouble getting the subtle tones of the light flesh. Sure. Um, it, or the same thing is with, let's say, painting a landscape. There's a lot of tendency there for people to paint a landscape on a red-toned ground. Yes, I understand that. Um, if you look at nature, perhaps an, an underlying tone to the whole scene might be a delicate shade of red. Um, <clears throat> uh, a well-known landscape painter, Aldro Hibbard, would use a, a would use a warmish red tone for a, for a sunny day effect and a, a cool red tone for a cloudy day effect. Mm. Un unfortunately, he didn't put the tone of red thin enough on the canvas. He would just, you know, cover it. It has to be an extremely thin tone, and the paint over it has to be very thick. Otherwise, oil paint becomes semi-transparent with age, and what comes underneath shows through. Sure. And, and if you look at a lot of Hibbard's work, uh, the landscapes have darkened as a result right. due to the due to the reddish underpainting. So I, fi I find it much better to try to hit the colors of nature as soon as you possibly can, period. Great. Richard, in regards to the palette you used to use for color cast painting, uh, what did that consist? What colors? Uh, basic, basic sort of colors of, of course, white, white, cadmium yellow, pale, uh, yellow ochre, cadmium red light, uh, lizard crimson, um, sometimes uh, um, uh, burnt sienna or raw, raw, raw umber, uh, and black. Um, sometimes you might use a little bit of ultramarine blue. Um, those are the basic colors. Sure. Concerning uh, very seldom, very seldom did you need anything. Like, very seldom did you need anything like green, a green tone or a, a light blue tone tone for cast painting. Sure. Concerning developing your color sensibility, Mr. Gamble set still life painting exercises for you, which you would continue working on back at the University of New Hampshire. These exercises would also help you in learning to blend and mani manipulate your edges. In fact, we have quoted that, quote, Gamble would sometimes have us spend two or three days just going over our still life, redoing the edges, unquote. Can you explain exactly what these still life, life projects involved? Well, they had to be simple sort of objects, uh, you know, some books on a shelf, maybe an egg in a dish, things like that. Sure. And and you and basically you would work on it until you couldn't work on it anymore. Um, you would certainly spend uh, perhaps a week or two weeks or maybe three weeks on a still life, and, and trying to uh, manipulate the paint to get it to do what you wanted. Um, one of the you know first of all you want to 
get the design, the design of your picture the way you want it. And then you have to get the big outside shapes, shapes of the masses of the picture. Then you need to develop where the edge of the shadow occurs on these masses. Then you focus on um, the colors and eventually the edges. In other words, edges uh, in nature, there are lost and found edges, and this is very ex important. Mm. Uh, um, photography, not so much. A camera looks at everything very closely and, and sees way too much detail. Mm. And, and when you look at an object, especially in, a, in, in an impressionist manner, that is when you look at the entire object at once, you don't see that much detail. You see masses of colors uh, that blend into each other here and there. Sometimes they're a little bit sharp. Sometimes they're very sharp. Sometimes they're very soft. Other times they're lost edges. For exa example, the shadow of a, of a, uh, a dark object against a dark background, chances are that object literally disappears in the background. There's no edge to that object, to that object, when you're looking at the whole thing at once, so learning how to learning how to paint in oils is basically done through still life painting. That's the great training. Absolutely. Now, during summers in Williamstown, Massachusetts, Mr. Gamble would have his students also focus on landscape painting. What do you recall of Mr. Gamble's approach to landscape? Here again, it was starting out with very simple things like the uh, distant hill in, versus a uh, field in the front. Uh, nothing very complicated. And I found landscape painting very challenging. It, it was, I struggled doing these small studies for, well, all of my first summer, first summer with him and into my second summer with him before I, I finally got onto it. I struggled greatly with landscape painting. Uh, I had no interest in it until I was forced to do it. And uh, eventually I fell in love with it. I mean, it was, I was very surprised because I was all, always interested in, in painting portraits. I, I had no, no feeling for landscape, but I developed that by being forced to do it. Sure. Now I understand landscape painting was a subject that connected you, connected with you on a deep level, as you have touched upon. In fact, you refer to yourself as a quote portrait painter whose secret passion is landscape painting unquote. What is it about landscape that appeals to you? Well, first, first of all, you can do whatever you want. When you're a portrait painter, you're oftentimes um, hampered by the demands of the client. Um, they may want to sit this sort certain way. They may want to wear this particular tie, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with landscape painting, you have a freedom to create whatever it is you want, um, and, and and it's more fun. Sure. Um, I sure. love I love being outdoors. Uh, nature is a very important thing to me. Um, one of my great heroes in life is Thoreau. Mm. Um, I read I read his book Walden three times at least. Wow! And it it influenced my life very much, which I'll talk about later on. But one I I was interested in. Th I had three loves. I had art, music, and nature. Mm -hmm. So early in my life, I either was going to be an artist or a musician or a biologist. So nature has always been a very important part of my life. Uh, secondly, the colors, going outdoors and looking at the colors of nature. I mean, it's just overwhelming. Nature is not shades of brown. Mm. As Monet discovered, uh, there's all kinds of colors in nature. In fact, Painting landscapes is is the way you develop an eye for for color. Sure. You know, the, the more landscape painting you do, chances are the better your eye gets to be. Mm -hmm. If you're really trying to if you're really trying to hit those color color notes. Right. 
And I, I suppose as well, Richard, uh, when we think about proportions in landscape painting, it tends to be quite forgiving. For instance, if you're painting a, a, a portrait or perhaps even a still life, one can very easily tell if you know a nose isn't quite right or whether the ellipse on the vessel isn't quite right. But uh, in, in landscape, the idea of proportion is, is a lot more loose and, and forgiving. Would you agree? Uh, definitely, I would agree to that. Um, regarding portrait painting, uh, Mr. Gamble used to say if Cleopatra had a quarter inch more on her nose, uh, the whole history of the world would have been different. <laughs> That's uh, yes, yes. Uh, when you're painting a tree, yes, it needs to have some sort of semblance. An elm tree ought to look pretty much like an elm tree, essentially in character. But every branch doesn't have to be painted there. If you wish to change branches to make it better here and there, I do that. That sort of thing. It, it allows me more creativity. I feel like I'm being more myself versus being um, somebody's employee mm. that I'm that I'm giving them a product. Sure. You have explained that Mr. Gamble's process to painting portraits began with a charcoal drawing on paper, whereby you focus on blocking in the main shapes of the portrait. Subsequently, the drawing would be transferred onto canvas. Something you notice about this process is that, quote, after you transferred the drawing, when things looked very, very good, and you then went to see it in color, things were off here and there that you wouldn't have noticed before in the black and white, unquote. As I understand, this has today led you to using charcoal to mark in only the general placement of the key landmarks of the face. Your justification behind this is that, quote, you don't see in color, sorry, you see in color, you don't see in black and white, unquote. This is a fascinating idea. Do you care to elaborate on it? Oh uh, yes, as I said, Mr. Gamble used to have us block and do a complex charcoal drawing on paper, and I did several of those. I know, and when I transferred them to canvas, I noticed that, uh, let's say, the left eye was off by an eighth of an inch, one side or another. It wasn't quite right. It looked great in the drawing, mm. but once you put down the colors of nature, try to make the thing literally come alive, any little mistake shows. That's just true. like that. Yeah. It's strange how that happens, yeah. Yeah. It 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 it, it has to be right. With a portrait, it has to be right or it's a failure, essentially. Right. Um by right I mean, you know, extremely close to what the real thing looks like. Um you know, people you know, people uh, may collect modern art for their home and so forth, but when they want their loved one painted, they really would rather see two eyes rather than three eyes. <laughs> That's true. And especially, you know, uh, John Singer Sargent used to say, the definition of a painting is a portrait that has something wrong with its mouth. Yeah, right, right. I'm sorry, a definition of a portrait is a painting that has something wrong with its mouth. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, an interesting fact about Sargent is he spent, he, he basically got very sick of doing portraits. And for the last quarter century of his life, most much of his life, he was a mural painter. And his murals are not as well known as his other work, although he considered it more artistic than portraits. Mm. Um, there, there is a, uh, I've, I've read that, uh, Sargent didn't have very many subjects that were that happy with their portraits, whereas, uh, uh, Jonio and so forth, um, uh, was, his subjects were always very pleased. Uh, Sargent's subjects were often, uh, uh there's a story of Sargent painting a little girl. Mm. And she was kind of homely. And the grandfather told him, you know, basically, you know, you know my, my granddaughter's homely. You know, I want you to straighten out her mouth and, and straighten out the nose and so forth. So Sargent did all that. And then the story goes that when he went to paint the grandfather, he made his mouth crooked and his nose crooked. <laughs> That's fascinating. 
Now, I understand there was a point when Mr. Gamble was interested in paintings that had a biblical theme. It seems as though this subject was also of interest to you, as you would come to take a course on the Bible as literature whilst at the University of New Hampshire. Was Mr. Gamble a religious man himself? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was a religious man in the sense that he went to, went to church. I never saw him go to church. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not aware that he attended church. Certainly, certainly Summers in Williamstown, he did not go to church right. on, on Sunday. However, he was very spiritual. Mm. And I think he had a deep faith in in what was good, what was ideal, what you know, what made great art. Why was it good? Um, what was beautiful music? He had a, he had a sense that all those things express something that's beyond man that honors honors uh, um, honors the world honor, honors. You paint a portrait. You're, you're you're making a statement that honors that person. Uh, you're painting a still life. You're honoring those objects. I think Gamble approached painting like that. He painted subjects where, you, in a religious manner, in the sense that he on, honored them. Mm. He tried to do the best work he could. He tried to, and sometimes ideally idealize what he saw for artistic reasons, because it felt it was more beautiful. Sure. He, he was very much concerned with beauty, which I think he equated with a, a spiritual feeling. Right, right. It's interesting because when I was reading uh, through your, your book on the letters of Mr. Gamble, there was one passage which uh, Gamble explained that he only really uh, made a choice to select students after much uh, prayer and fasting, I believe he, he, the words he used. Do you recall yeah. that uh, passage? Yes, I do. Yes, it's interesting. So it it kind of, it does seem that he had some kind of uh, you know religion or, or spiritual belief that was quite deep deep seated. Oh, I I believe that's absolutely true. Look at his paintings. I mean, uh, mm. they they involve psychological subjects, as you said. Many of his early works were biblical in nature. Uh, he was concerned about the the decay of Western civilization, mm. it, what, what he saw, what he saw as a decay of re Western civilization in all of the arts and in philosophy, uh, perhaps even in, shall we say, religion mm. or, or spiritual matters. So I think that, uh, yes, he was a very spiritual man. Sure. Can you mention a little bit about your own uh, course on studying the Bible as literature at the University of New Hampshire? Um, I, I read various passages of the Bible, certainly some of it's very beautiful, some of the Psalms and so forth. Uh, but, but here again, uh, I, I could sort of consider myself similar to him in the way that I'm not a religious man, I'm a very spiritual one. Mm. And I've been interested in all, all various religions. I've dabbled in Hinduism, you know, Bhagavad Gita, Buddhism, uh, various uh, uh, yogi, yogis, uh, Sri Aurobindo, uh, Guru Maharaji. I believe there's something there. Mm. I, think, I think all religions, all religions are essentially talking about the same sort of thing. Right. That... that you know, people people say there's no God or whatever. I, I disagree. I think, uh, especially in the 21st century, we now know that, you know, we're a tiny little planet in a huge galaxy that's one of billions of galaxies that go on forever. Therefore, our very existence is miraculous. Mm. It's miraculous. Mm. It's miraculous, especially miraculous, of course, with modern technology that you and I are talking to each other on 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 time here, six thousand miles away from each other. I mean, that's miraculous. It is. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci couldn't, you know, dream. They dreamed of these things. I mean, now I can, I can go up in a plane thirty five thousand feet. Every time I fly, I think it's it's a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. It is. So. 
So we're surrounded by miracles. The thing is, we don't really appreciate it. We and I, I, there's a saying. I think it's uh, uh, um, Cervantes. Mm. Uh, you know, the greatest sin is ingratitude. Right. Right. Yeah. And that phrase struck me very much because you know that's that's right. Yes. Um, no matter how miserable your life may be, you see the sun, beautiful sunset, which everybody else can see. You should at least say, "Oh my God, thank you, mm -hmm. thank thank you to whatever it is. Be grateful for whatever you're experiencing." I think you should focus on what's beautiful and what's good about life rather than focusing on what's terrible about it. That's great advice there, Richard. Thank you. Moving forward, I understand during your senior years at the University of New Hampshire, two events occurred that would ultimately have a major effect on the direction of your future. The first event being the month and a half you took to paint a portrait from life of one of the university's janitors. This portrait was selected for exhibition at the annual senior art show. However, the painting was displayed in the dark under a staircase. How did you react to this placement of your work? Well, of course, I was insulted. Yeah. I was also, I was also, it was also, shall we say, um, a great tribute. Mm. Um, my, my history, art history professor, uh, I understand, would tell his students, go see Whitney's portrait. Mm. Uh, he never told me that. He was similar to Mr. Gamble. He was, he was a difficult individual, um, and we disagreed on art. Um, he thought Thomas Aikens was the greatest painter America had produced. I thought John Singer Sargent was. Mm. Interest, interestingly, you know, um, you know, 50 years later, Aikens, people hardly mention Aikens, and it's all Sargent, Sargent, Sargent. Right, right. Um, that didn't go over well with that professor. Mm. Uh, we had arguments about art, and he basically th threat threatened to uh, kick me out of school. Okay. He lowered my he lowered my grade in art history because he disagreed with me. Mm. So I did I didn't graduate summa cum laude. I graduated magna cum laude. Mm. Now this was, was this Mr. Hatch or another professor? Oh no, it was another professor, Professor Fascinelli. Oh, I see. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, he he was a brilliant man. Uh, he also taught film. My understanding was Harvard University wanted him, but he he liked living in New Hampshire instead. All right. But he was he was he was a terror. He was uh, very well known for a terrible temper. <laughs> His students feared him. Right. Right. Um, so, but anyway, that was, you know, that was an honor that it was under the staircase. The, the faculty clearly recognized that I was a threat mm. and they didn't want the public to see that a student was doing that kind of work. Remember, remember this is the age when, uh, Jackson Pollock was splattering paint on a canvas, you know, in a drunken state. Right, right. And, and this is considered the greatest artist of the 20th century. I disagree with that. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's fascinating, Richard, hearing you speak because of all the uh, prior Mr. Gamble students that I've, that I've spoken with, I mean, they've all had the same experience when it comes to their, their, uh, their university years of just being uh, rejected. And in what you're saying, I mean, it, it's a shared experience. Absolutely. Uh, it's happened to many of my, my students I've had literally dozens of of uh, older students come to me. They had gone to art school or a university. They started to draw the model carefully. They were ridiculed. They were thrown out of class. They changed majors. They dreamed of being artists, but they were discouraged. Mm. And they had careers in other professions. And you know, age fifty or sixty, they started painting again. And so this was this has been a very common experience, and it still goes on. Right. And yeah. It, it still goes on. Um, the majority of art schools don't teach anything now in terms of technique. That's right. Um, I, I had a student very recently 
who got a master's degree at an art institute here in New Hampshire. And you know what his projects were? What's that? He, were, he was to do, read books on art aesthetics and do term papers. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. It was all theory-based. It's theor theorized, yes. In yeah. other words, art, is, art has become psychology. Exactly. And philosophy. And philosophy. Mm -hmm. Illustrative psychology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. Uh, I have a friend who was a, a teacher at Cushing Academy, probably the best uh, secondary high school art school in the country. Mm. And he's retiring and he can't find a replacement. All these people will come to him with PhDs and they talk about uh, emotion and this and that, but they couldn't, they, they knew nothing about how to paint. Mm -hmm. they, they, they knew nothing about how to throw a pot how to uh, uh, do a painting on a computer. Mm -hmm. they, were they were totally ignorant, but they knew how to talk the talk. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, all, it's all, you know, if you can articulate yourself, I mean, it takes the box. But when it comes to the doing, the prac, the craft, the craft side has been completely forgotten. And that's exactly right. It's the artist statement that's everything. You know, yeah. Whitney's, fir Whitney's first law of art the longer the artist's statement, the worse the work of art. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I, I, cha I challenge you to find a, an exam an exception to that. I swear you go. If, you should be able to look at something and get something out of it right away without having to read a, a five page document about what the, what those three white bricks in the corner of the room represent. Yeah. I mean, that's excuse me. That's all bullshit. Mm. That's that's the emperor has no clothes. Mm. That's exactly there's it's a lot it's illustrated philosophy. It's not really it's a different form of art, shall we say. Some of it is well done, mm. but it's a completely different form of art. And these two things are separate. Uh, we should not be forced to admire one of one kind of art and be told that the other kind of art is just illustration and it's not worth anything. Sure. And it's interesting as well when we when we think about uh, getting the work to speak for itself. Uh, you know that can put a lot of the the contemporary program artists uh, in trouble because what the, what do they have to show? And that's correct. The second event that had a major impact on the course of your life at the University of New Hampshire concerned a senior art project you had to complete. You decided to create a white on white painting to collect materials for the painting. You visited a car yard and obtained a few spare parts. You go on to state, quote, The day the painting was due, I glued the automobile parts onto a masonite panel and poured a gallon and a half of gesso on it, unquote. The work was received very well by your professor, who claimed the painting was one of the best abstract works done at the university during that year. He also stated that you, quote, would be a great abstract painter, with just a little more training, unquote. How did you respond to these comments? Well, I, I, you know, in my own mind, you know, I thought it was complete, you know, bullshit. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, if it was that easy for me to do something in a day and be considered a potentially great abstract painter with just a little more training, and it took me a month and a half to work on a a portrait of the school janitor where I was still struggling with it at the very end of it, uh, I realized, you know, at least for me, abstract painting was a, a piece of cake. Mm. And, and, and hence, how could it really be a great, great art? A uh, great art is something which takes time, it takes great, great skill, and it also needs to express emotion. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it was just sort of the final straw. I mean, uh, the professor ended up uh, teaching at the uh, Rhode Island School of Design. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that tells you something about him. He was a big deal. Mm. But I, th I thought the guy was a total idiot. Um, he, came, he came to class, basically. He said, this is your magnum opus project. You, I want you to do a white-on-white -white painting. You've got a month to do it. I'll see you in a month. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his that was his instruction. And, and it was like, you know, this is bullshit. Right. And excuse, excuse my words, folks. 
but I don't know how to how to express it. And I, I guess today it's okay to use swear words mm. if they are if they're most appropriate to the expression of what you want to say. Mm. And it, and it's a shame that uh, you know so many people still believe that you know uh, oh the 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 splatter, splattering of a Jackson Pollock. Is a is an extraordinarily great work of art. I mean, yes, it's some of it is excellent uh, uh, decorate the decoration, wallpaper, what have you, but it can't compare at all with the Sistine ceiling, for example. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it is absurd. Um, uh, I have a good story about uh, modernism and uh, classical painting. Uh, Classical painting, at least in the 50s and 60s, was very much passé, um, consisted of painters who were mere illustrators. They weren't great artists like Picasso or Matisse. And this is what the public believed, uh, except there was one gentleman in England who didn't believe that. His name was Andrew Lloyd Webber. And when he was a young man, he used to walk by this window in a, in his neighborhood where hanging in the window was Flaming June mm. by Lord Layton. Yeah Flaming, yeah. June, Flaming June. 500 pounds. Mm. For only 500 pounds, <laughs> he could buy Flaming June. Well, he went to his grandmother to borrow the money. She said no. That's just, he's just a crummy illustrator. He's not a great artist. So Andrew Lloyd Webber didn't buy Flaming June. 30 years later, he's visiting um, Puerto Rico. And he goes to the museum in the southern part of Puerto Rico, and there is Flaming June. <laughs> he was so excited, he went up to the museum curator he said, I'll give you $5 million for it. The curator said, no. I'll give you $10 million for it. The curator said, no. I really want that painting. I'll give you $15 million for it. The curator said, no, it's not for sale. Now, he could have had that painting for, let's say, <laughs> $1,000 in 1960. That's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, one yeah, one reason for the reemergence of classical painting is all these great masterpieces of the 19th century became very uh, affordable, mm. and people started investing into them in it. Um, and now, you know, these investments have, you know, quadrupled numerous times in value. They become, you know. A painting, a bougereau that you used to be able to get for two or three thousand dollars is now a million or two million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Michael Jackson owned a bunch of bougereaus. Mm. Uh, other uh, Hollywood celebrities owned some classical paintings as well. Yeah. Some of the great masters. So, so the value of the work has increased, and now these great masters are considered. Uh, serious painters by even institutions such as Harvard, they recognize that there was a dichotomy, uh, you know, that some painters continued with the academic tradition, while others were uh, drawn to Impressionism and then post-Impressionism and Expressionism and Dadaism and blah, blah, blah-ism. Mm. Yeah, that, it's fascinating how that all um, has worked out, but that that's an interesting story. That uh, that story of Flaming June, I, I wasn't uh, aware of that one before. I haven't heard it before. Uh, taste taste go up and down like mm. the like waves of an ocean. Right. Um, you know, hundred years after Rembrandt, you know, was born, he was you know uh, nobody, and then a uh, hundred fifty years later, he was a great artist again. You know, same yeah. with Michelangelo. Uh, what great. Uh, Guido Reni was the great artist of his mm. day. Now, who who knows Guido Reni now? Nobody's heard of him. That's right. It's, yeah. you know, it's Michelangelo that's important. Mm. Uh, Beethoven was a bum for a while. Uh, uh, Emerson hated Beethoven. Mm. Now Beethoven's God. Yep. 
if things go up and down and there's hope that you know the good good classical painters of the 20th century that are such as myself and many many others who study with gamma will someday be appreciated for what they've done absolutely i believe that that definitely will turn around at some point down in the future hopefully soon yeah hopefully I'm, soon. I'm getting on in age i'd like to <laughs> i'd like to die as a legend rather than, <laughs> rather than a poor legend you know what i mean <laughs> Soon after graduating from the University of New Hampshire in 1968 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, he, won, he went on to continue training with Mr. Gamble full-time at the Fenway Studios in Boston for an additional two years. In total, he trained with Mr. Gamble for five years, between the years 1965 to 1970. Can you recall these later years after college and what the focus of your training was and if it differed at all from your initial training with Mr. Gamble? It didn't differ that much. It was more of the same, a lot of uh, figure drawing and still life painting. And uh, I could see that you know, Mr. Gamble had a heart attack. He was also hit by a car. Mm. He was having health problems. So he was more often times more irritable than he was before. I mean, he... Mr. Gamble was the greatest man, I've, greatest person I've ever met. He was also not perfect by any any means. He could be extraordinarily generous, which he was. He could also be extraordinarily cruel, which he also was. And I and I could see, the better I the better I got as an artist, the more he started to attack me as a human being. Mm. Um, he would put me down. He used to call me, a, have, used to say I had a dead hat at personality. Fact is, I was terrified of him anyway. Everybody was. But I, I reached out to him at times. But here again, he, you know, you never you never knew when Gamma would blow up out of the blue at something. I mean, he was, he was notorious. Uh, Bob Hunter used to say when Mr. Gamble would go to the St. Patal's Club, the entire room would would uh, leave. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So he he was a difficult man. I understand his bitterness. I, I, I do understand all that now. I understand his frustration with his physical problems in that he took it out on us. I could also see that as my eye was getting very, very good, his eye, I, I wasn't learning anything more from him. Mm. And I was very troubled by this for the last maybe year. I ba basically learned nothing more from him. And drawing daily and so forth became more tedious, more uh, um, killing my spirit. Mm. I, I started to feel as though I was beginning to hate what I was doing. So I, I, one, one thing that I did was I wrote to Richard Lack because Richard Lack was known as you know, one of Gamble's very finest students and a great teacher. I explained my situation, what was going on. He wrote back to me that he strongly suggested that I leave Mr. Gamble. That after, a, after three or four years of training, it was time to leave. If you stayed longer than that, he would kill your artistic spirit. Uh, he, he, Bob Cormier told me that after he painted the uh, man in the fur collar and pastel, Mr. Gamble never treated him the same. Wow. Yeah, and so it, it was, I could see that you know, when you started to become quite proficient at what you were doing, you were a threat to him personally. Sure. And uh, I, I saw that. I didn't, I didn't put this in my book because it's, uh, I think reading his letters, if you go through the whole thing, you will see that he could also be very difficult. I, I, I let him speak for himself mm. because he's not, he's not here to defend himself. But one, one incident uh, Sam Rose and I were drawing from the figure 
And Gam Gamble came in and took a look at Sam's painting, Sam's drawing, and exploded. And he started screaming at Sam, you know, you don't, you never learn when I teach you, you're so, you know, you've, you're going to be a failure, so on and so forth. About 10, 15 minutes of screaming at him. Uh, Gamble left, and Sam, of course, was devastated. And he took me into his uh, room, a room down the hall, showed me a new drawing he did of a, of a male. It was beautiful. It was sensitive as one could be. I mean, it was gorgeous. Um Sam also tried one point in time. He did a, a drawing, a, a drawing of a nude man's back, and he framed it in in an old frame with an old mat. He showed it to Mr. Gamble, and Gamble said, "Nobody alive can do anything like that. It's remarkable." And so Sam Sam didn't say anything to Mr. Gamble that it was his work, but he told his felt the students at the time, Mr. Gamble. Can see it said that I can draw. Ah. So this was happening. Um, and Richard Lack said, you know, you've got to get out of there. Because the students that stayed with Mr. Gamble longer than five years were psychologically affected, I would say, for the rest of their lives. Hmm. And it took me a long time to get over gamolitis, I call it. Hmm. The negative part. I mean, I loved the, any criticism artistically of my work was valid. I loved it. But don't criticize my taste in music. Don't tell me how to play badminton when I'm trying to relax. Don't tell me what book I should read or not read, et cetera, et cetera. Don't tell me how to run my life. Don't tell me I shouldn't get married. Don't tell me that if I got married, it would, it would end in utter mediocrity. Uh, you know, that's none of your business. His business was to teach me how to paint, which he did. And then he, then it became a very negative affair at the end. Mm. Richard, it's fascinating uh, this, this, this hearing you, you reminisce, and, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, what I want to try and get to, though, is where is that bitterness coming from, from Mr. Gamble? I mean, I know he was born in a, into an era that really uh, despised the kind of work that he, he loved. He felt like Western culture was deteriorating. But you mentioned he had some um, physical problems as well that he was quite bitter about. Uh, I mean, where, where do you think essentially the root of all that is, that, that, that evil, or that, that, that bitterness rather? Well, of course, he survived. He saw the damage done to World War I, yep. which basically destroyed the culture of West, or changed the culture completely of Western civilization. No question about it. And that was very, very upsetting. And then when you realize you're one of the few peop living people who really know how to paint in the sense of how the great masters painted and you're no longer recognized as being the great artist you are, it's got to be extremely upsetting. Mm. And uh, so I understand his bitterness, um, but it's unfortunate that he took it out on those who loved him the most, mm. many, many of his students. And some of his students went on to behave like that themselves um, I, I know of a couple of students who whose their careers were destroyed because they acted very pompous and toward a gallery owner or whatever, and and you know that was it. Um, um, it. It's very very sad. You know, the rest of us could not behave like that. I mean, I'm not a, I was not a very wealthy person. I could not tell people off. I tried to be nice. I try to explain my point of view as well as I could. I think you, you, you know, you you can attract more flies with honey than with vinegar. Mm. Uh, the other thing is, Mr. when he trained with Mr. with Paxton Gamble, uh, pa Paxton would come in and oftentimes put his cigar out on Gamble's palate. Wow. And Gamble used to say, you know, that really pissed me off. I was really furious. Mm. That sort of, and then also he he told Gamble that he drew like a cow. Wow. Okay. So, you know, that kind of training back then, I think there was a lot of 
a lot of training where you, as Mr. Gamble said, you know, you, you tear the person down and then you build them back up. Mm. But then unfortunately, then he started to tear them down again. Mm -hmm. And that's when I had to leave. But, the, but I understand a lot of where that bitterness came from. Mm -hmm. What about his uh, physical disability? Did he have some kind of uh, a pr problem with his, uh, with, his, with his body, essentially? Uh, well, he is very short in nature, short in stature, and he was quite homely. Mm. Um, he he never married. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you know a, a little Napoleon. Right, right. Um, I guess no, not that all short people are like that, but oftentimes very short people uh, are bitter. Mm. Uh, homely people are, are are bitter because you know that you know that, that God did God didn't give them good looks or whatever. I mean, it's life is unfair. Sure. Moving on, after you left Mr. Gamble's studio, Sam Rose gave you a page that he had recovered from Mr. Gamble's journal. These notes are very revealing of your relationship and are somewhat bittersweet as they show that your absence seems to not have affected Mr. Gamble, as is evidenced in his journal entry from August 29, 1970. Quote, The summer feels over and seems to have gone by with amazing rapidity. It has been the happiest of my Williamstown summers, uneventful, occupied, serene. And now these early evenings and cool nights, changing leaves and departing birds, bring the familiar autumn pang. Richard is in the offing still, but I do not ask his plans. I do not try to guess his future. That exceptionally talented young man does not evoke interest, nor do I resent his defection, though I would be justified to a point in so doing. I have never had so apt a pupil. He never did anything offensive or untoward, yet I hardly notice his absence and hardly care whether or not he ever returns. Unquote. Indeed, Mr. Gamble could be brutal at times. Reading this for the first time must have hurt you. Looking back at this letter today, do you feel any sense of resentment to Mr. Gamble? Uh, at the time, I was devastated um, because I had struggled about returning to him uh, that summer, perhaps doing a part-time. I had, I, I, I had married my college sweetheart uh, while I was still in college, that did not go over well with Mr. Gamble. Um, Mr. Gamble gave Richard Lack a very, very hard time when Richard Lack got married. Mm. But that did not go over well. Uh, but as you, uh, in the letter, one of the Gamble's letters, he was trying to convince me to come back and study with him again. And by that time, I had read Sam's notes um, about what Mr. Gamble had told had written in his journal, and I was, you know, I was just devastated. Um, um, in redoing, in, in going through his letters after 50 years, I had to come across some of these negative things, and it was hard for me to, I had to relive some of this, and it was hard for me to do so. Um, but I felt that uh, I needed to tell the, to the whole story. You know, this, this man basically gave me everything I have as a painter, but I paid a heavy price for it. Mm. And, uh, you know, in my own teaching, I've tried to be as considerate and nice to my students as possible. I've tried never to be negative. Mm -hmm. uh, do I still feel resentment? I, I One of the reasons I published his letters as sort of a, a as a catharsis. Mm. Um, I, I felt that I had to deal with these things before I die, um, that I didn't, I didn't, I should get rid of any resentments I had of him now rather than carrying it me, carrying it with me for my entire life. Um, I needed to get rid of all that negativity and just focus on what was good about it the wonderful opportunity I had, uh, how fortunate I was to study with such a great man, 
uh, regardless of his imperfections. Um, I think of, of uh, um, other people who have achieved success. Judy Garland, her mother was ruthless, brutal to her. Mm. She, made, she made Judy Garland into a great, well, Judy Garland had that talent, but she rammed it down her throat, made her into the great singer that she was. And of course, Judy Garland paid a huge price. Mm. Um, uh, same with uh, uh, the golfer, our golfer. Um, uh, his father, well, yeah, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, his father drove him. Mm. Um, sometimes that happens. Uh, Mozart. Mm -hmm. his, his father hounded him. Sure. But it's entirely possible Mozart would not have been Mozart without his father getting on his back. Right, right. So I recognize that, uh, as, as an artist told me, you know, Mr. Gamble put me through hell, but it made me stronger. And it, it made me able to survive and become something. Lovely. Now, you have touched on uh, a little bit of this next question in your prior answers. What is your opinion on Mr. Gamble's psychology, as I've heard from some of his former students say that he had some problems? Well, I think basically, as, you know, here again, when you were a young student, you were heroic, you were wonderful, everything you did was great. When you became an accomplished person, you were a threat. You were, you know, you were a competitor. And I think he needed to feel like he was king of the mountain. Sure. Why was it that Mr. Gamble did not allow his students to bring females into the studio? Oh, uh, he felt he, he, he never, he, he, he criticized one female's uh, student's work because uh, her husband had, was a student of his, but Otherwise, he did not have any female students. He had the view that, you know, if he trained female students, they were going to get pregnant, get married, and be more focused on their families and, and would not become great painters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, that you know, he was a misogynist. Now, that misogyny, was that based on perhaps his relationship with his mother, do you think? It's possible. I know that he lived with his mother until she was 104, I believe, when she died. Wow. So that's, that's a possibility. There was certainly a strong relationship there, but I don't know any details. I do know that Mr. Gamble did not want to take on female students. He felt that uh, they would basically go on and get married and so forth and would not be able to devote themselves full time to painting. Yeah. Um, he also kind of put down f uh, women artists as well. I noticed that uh, Gretchen Rogers was uh, uh, a wonderful early uh, Boston painter, early turn of the 20th century. And uh, she was a student of Tarbell, uh, Edmund Tarbell, mm -hmm. the great master. And he, he said that she was his best student and that she was a genius. Wow. Well, in Mr. Gamble's book on the Boston painters, he mentions Gretchen Rogers briefly, mainly sort of that she was sort of a housewife. Okay. It was very, it was very uh, off-putting. It was not respectful. Um, I've seen you know, the best Gretchen Rogers portraits are better than his portraits. Um, there is a fabulous self-portrait at the Boston Museum, uh, which is, you know, I can't find anything wrong with it. I mean, it's just magnificent. It's masterful. Wow. And uh, so I think, uh, I, you know, here again, you know, as I've been saying earlier, Gamma was a very great man, uh, but he had problems as well as all the rest of us have. Sure. Now, you mentioned, Richard, that's, uh, Gamble was opposed to the idea of Mr. Lack 
uh, getting married, and he also yourself, he was quite uh, opposed to that idea. Now, uh, why did he believe that getting married would only leave, ever lead to mediocrity? Um, I think, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, if you have t children, two or three children, you need to go to work and earn a living. That can interfere with just painting. I mean, he never had to work. He never had to earn a living the way the rest of us have. Uh, I don't think he understood the problems that the rest of us have. Um, yeah. Sure. So moving on to students who had just completed their training, Mr. Gamble advised to find a part-time job which would provide a living and the opportunity to paint during their free time. He also encouraged students to find a studio space that was ideal as possible, explaining that if one could only find a studio which has eastern lighting instead of northern, then it would be wise to paint in the afternoon. He encouraged students to not let anything stand in their way, whether that was materials or space. His determination to succeed can be felt in the following quotes. Quote, spend your time painting and learning to see, finding your vision and saying what you want. Never give up. Never surrender. Don't be a follow-up. Unquote. Is there any other advice which Mr. Gamble gave you towards the end of your training which has really stuck with you? I think those three specific things uh, are really the strongest uh, things that I remember. Um, he didn't really give me much advice after I said that I was going to leave him. Um, I, at the time, I, I told him that, you know, I, I had been married and we had a child, uh, Deborah, and I, basically my excuse was that I needed to go to work and, and, and earn a living. And that um, we sort of made it, made it such that uh, uh, the possibility was that I would might be able to come back and so forth. And we left it like that for maybe I could get to get back to him next summer. So we left it like that. Sure. Now, after this period in 1970, you moved to Keene, New Hampshire, and tried to earn a living painting portraits. After struggling to make ends meet for several years, Mr. Willis suggested that you take your work to Boston and show it to the galleries on Newbury Street. You followed Mr. Willis' advice in 1975 and had a breakthrough when Vos Galleries gave you your first major commission. As you go on to quote, quote, they said, we hate to insult you, but can you paint a portrait for a thousand dollars? I said, sure I could. I've been doing them for a hundred bucks, unquote. Can you recall these years and explain your struggles in trying to earn a living as a portrait painter? Uh, yes, I can. Um... I, I began by, after I moved back to Keene, New Hampshire, I began by teaching painting, portrait painting classes at Sharon Art Center in Peterborough. Uh, in 1972, I was awarded the third Green Shield Foundation grant from Montreal, so I toured Europe for three weeks to study representational painting. Uh, I went to Rome, Florence, Venice, Paris, uh, London, and Madrid. And I even saw all of the paintings in the Louvre. It took me four and a half days, eight hours a day doing it. Um, so it was an enlightening experience for me. I just, I just filled myself with great art. And then I came back here and determined to work even harder to achieve what I wanted to. Uh, in 1973, I was invited to reestablish the art department at Cushing Academy in Ashburnham, Mass where I was encouraged to pass on the knowledge of representational painting. Uh, I taught there until 1981 on a part-time basis. I would drive down to Cushing two or three times a week, in, either in the afternoons, and that was a 45-minute trip each way, or in the evenings, and I did that until 1981. Um, in 1979, I rented studio space on Mechanic Street in Keene, New Hampshire, where I set up uh, Monadnock Studios. I formed an atelier of students. I had a number of students who uh, rented rooms in that building, and they would that, that would be their studios, and and I would go around and critique them. And so that. Monadnock Studios, uh, I tutored a group of New Hampshire students, many of them who have continued into careers as artists and as art educators. 
Um, I was also very much involved in the American Society of Portrait Artists in Montgomery, Alabama. At the time, it was the world's largest portrait society. And I eventually served as its chairman. Um, that was a great experience, uh, being able to speak at the Metropolitan Museum in New York on the great uh, the uh, principles of uh, representational painting and organizing shows for hundreds of people from all over the world. I was featured twice in American Artist Magazine, the first as a cover artist in April 90, 1982, and later in April 2000. Uh, in 1982, a collector commissioned me to spend three weeks in Alaska, where I began work on nine paintings of Mount McKinley and the surrounding area. Um, later on, I brought these paintings back to my studio in New Hampshire and, and worked to finish them from photographs that I had taken as well and rolled them up and sent them to my collector friend in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, in 1987, I was commissioned to paint Cardinal Umberto Medeiros for the Catholic University of Portugal. And I went to Portugal for the unveiling in Lisbon, and I was awarded the Medal Benemerito. Uh, this was shown on Portuguese television. Unfortunately, the transmission to the st TV stations in New England, uh, it was in a different channel, and they couldn't transmit the news broadcast. So that was uh, unfortunate for me. Mm. Uh, it's been up and down, of course up and down. Um, I did, in 1992, I was commissioned to paint a portrait of a Japanese couple and spent three months living and traveling in Japan. That was also a, a great experience, a very enlightening one. Uh, I, I very much admired some, of, uh, some aspects of Japan and, and found other aspects disappointing. It was tough because I lived in Hachioji, uh, which was an hour and a half from Tokyo by uh, bullet train. And that was my studio where I uh, painted uh, this couple uh, that were living in Japan. I also got to travel and see Mount Fuji, and I did a painting of a temple in Kyoto. Um, I've done other uh, portraits, uh, including presidential candidate Mitt Romney, uh, Nobel laureates Paul Samuelson and Philip Sharp, Secretary of the Navy James Webb, Robert Rice, Secretary of Labor, and the actor Ethan Hawke. Um, I've been very busy serving on boards. I've been on the board of advisors for the Connecticut Society of Portrait Artists, uh, the advisory board of the Art Renewal Center, which is the largest art gallery in the world, online, online art gallery. And I'm on the board of advisors for the American Renaissance for 21st Century Foundation in New York City. I've served on the board also of the New Hampshire Council of the Art. And I've judged numerous uh, art shows over the years in this area of New England. So I've been very busy. Um, I've had a second daughter, my youngest daughter, Emily, um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for my life. It's been, it's been quite an experience. It sounds like uh, you've had quite the journey there, Richard. That's, uh, that's, that's incredible. Can I ask, when you went to Europe and you were studying uh, all the masterworks, was there any in particular that really uh, captivated you or inspired you in a way that was unexpected? Um, I, uh, uh, of course, I, I had not looked at uh, Bosch, Honor, Honor, yeah. Bosch, I forgot how you pronounce his name. Mm. Um, certainly a, a fantasy, fantasy painter. Sure. Uh, I love his work. Mm. It's, uh, it's not classical in the sense that what I am teaching or what Mr. Gamble is teaching, but I was fascinated by it. Of course, uh, seeing the Velasquez paintings in the, in the Prado, I went there to see them. Um, I thought 
his portrait, especially of uh, young dwarfs, uh, were magnificent, as well as Las Meninas. Um, I loved the early Flemish masters. I was I fell in love with the very small little miniature paintings, you know, six by mm. eight paintings. <clears throat> so when I came back to New Hampshire, I was determined to do one of those. And I did actually several small paintings over the course of a few years at that, that time. But the first one was of my friend Sandy Lochner. He worked for me part time and he agreed to pose for his portrait in exchange for a camera. So he gave me a lot of sittings and I painted him in his leather jacket. He has a red beard and the painting is nine by seven inches and it, it caused quite a sensation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it helped establish, establish my uh, career as an artist in Boston. Sure. Uh, now talk about that. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Or actually, we mentioned the Vos Galleries, didn't you? Yes, I, I did. That, yes, I took that little painting of Sandy Lochner under my arm, and I went up and down Newbury Street visiting the galleries. Uh, I remember Van Dyke did the same thing with his portrait uh, that he painted when he was, I think, 24. Uh, and so <laughs> I, went up, I went up and down the galleries. I, I of course, went into some modernist galleries and of course they showed me right out the door immediately <laughs> and I went to um, the um, uh, well, different galleries I was offered one man shows uh, the deal would be they want exclusive representation and I had to frame everything in gold leaf and I tried to explain I'm, I don't have the money to frame everything in gold leaf you know I'm, I'm married with a family and I'm working as a artist and teacher. I don't have that kind of money. I, um, and then I went into Vos Galleries I, and I showed my little painting to Bill Vos. He took one look at it and he ran upstairs to see uh, old man Vos, Robert Vos, senior. Mm -hmm. and, and Robert came downstairs, took a look at my painting of Sandy Lochner, and he said, uh, you know, I didn't know anybody alive could paint like that. Wow. And then, and then that's when he said, we hate to insult you, but can you do a portrait for $1,000? Okay, right, right. And I said, I, you know, I've been doing them for $100. I told this story to Bob Cormier, mm -hmm. who, laughed, who laughed and said, Richard, I wouldn't even pee for $100. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, um, that was quite a, 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 a long period of time where, you know, I lived in apartments. I did not have my own home at all. Uh, and it was, you know, half my life basically was struggling like that. Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, just going back to Keene for a moment, uh, Richard, did you maintain contact with Mr. Gamel uh, whilst there? I, and I wrote back and forth to him a couple letters, uh, and when he invited me to study with him the following summer, I made, I just ex said that I couldn't do it. Sure. Um, as you, you know, you will, we'll talk about that later. There were reasons why I was very nice to him. I never told him the exact reasons why I left him. Sure. Sure. And, uh, um, yeah, I didn't want to do that. Uh, but that I made very little contact with him. Uh, Richard Lack suggested you needed to make a clean break. It's very, very hard to leave Mr. Gamel, and it has to be a very clean break, which is what I did. And it, um, it was about five years later that I contacted him again. I showed, I sent him some photographs of portraits that I had done. And of course, he would write back, you know, you, you don't know how to paint portraits, you're a failure, and so forth. Mm. <laughs> sure. Now, I think you've done a great job of explaining your life after Keen. Uh, so moving on to my next question, I understand you are a relative of the French Rococo painter Francois Bouchard. How did you find this out? Uh, with, uh, I was adopted, mm -hmm. as I had mentioned, and after my birth parents died, I 
did some search and I was reunited with my birth mother, mm. who happens who happened to be uh, head of the textile division of the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. She was well known in the text, um, textile industry. Uh, I had a, I have a half sister who is a abstract painter, sort of in the style of Rothko. Mm. She does, she does uh, basically solid a solid color canvas, and only she can see the design underneath. And I had a half brother, Robinson, who was a, a abstract uh, sculptor in Philadelphia. He did sort of tetrahedrons and different uh, um, types of forms like that. He had Parkinson's disease. He got it at age 26, and he died when he was 72. He was the longest surviving person in the country with Parkinson's disease. And he was a very remarkable man. I, I, I loved my uh, half-brother. Um, but after meeting them, it was very, very clear that had I grown up in that family, I would not be a classical painter. Mm. I would have been, I would have been my, my style probably would be more toward modernism, uh, some form of that. I would have been an artist, certainly. I would have been very well known in New York, possibly because uh, my birth birth mother had great connections in New York. And I also found out from my birth mother that the um, Friedenthal's, um, the, um, she was a Friedenthal, her, her husband was David Friedenthal, who was a famous artist during uh, World War II. He was the cover artist for Life magazine. Mm -hmm. And he was quite a remarkable person, but a wild man. He had several affairs and treated my mother horribly, so she left him. Went up to, to Vermont, to a cabin in Vermont. The roof was leaking, and John Kent uh, fixed the roof, and I was the result of that union. Oh, I see. And anyway, the Kelloggs, my mother was a Kellogg. Mm. And, and, and the Kelloggs married the Bouchers, or Bouchers, of, of uh. France. And so I'm a direct descendant of Francois Boucher. I think he's my great, 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 great grandfather. That's fascinating, incredible. But I, I, I so it's in my blood. Sure, and, sure. And my my adopted parents spoke about this background that I had, that and they knew that my mother and her ancestors and so forth were very artistic. So they encouraged that. They looked for that. They wanted that in their child. And had I known what I know now, I would have treated my folks with greater respect at the time. Now, moving on. Indeed, following the years after your training, you have been very successful as a traditional painter, Vastar, as you have come to explain. Today, I understand you live in Stoddart, New Hampshire, and you are represented by over 15 art dealers and agents nationwide. Your portraits and landscapes hang in over 800 public and private art collections worldwide. They include the Anchorage Museum of Art, the Anderson House Museum, the Newark Museum, the Pentagon, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford Universities, and the Catholic University of Portugal. Among your many accomplishments are portraits of eight U.S. governors, three U.S. senators, and two Nobel laureates. In 2017, you received the Lottie Jacobi Living Treasure Award for the state of New Hampshire. Your paintings have also been reproduced in the book Edmund C. Tarbell, and the Boston School of Painting. You're an honorary member of both the Allied Artists of America and the American Artists Professional League. You're also a member of the Guild of Boston Artists and a lifetime member of the Copley Society of Art. Other memberships have included the National Arts Club, the Players and the Societies of Illustrators. You are recognized, you are recognized as an ARC Living Master by the Art Renewal Center. You have also been honored by Sotheby's of New York as a Living Master of the Classical Tradition. You were the cover artist for the April 1982 issue of American Artists and were featured again in April 2000. You are the youngest artist in history to have a painting in the permanent collection of the state capital of Massachusetts. You are the only living painter of the Boston School to have a PhD. 
He have won over 40 regional and national awards, as well as three grants from the Green Shields Foundation of Montreal. Although you left the University of New Hampshire to the disappointment of your professors, it's interesting to think that 45 years later, the university would grant you an honorary Doctorate of Fine Arts in 2015 in recognition of your distinguished attainments. The honorary degree citation reads in part, quote, we have been hailed as one of the giants of the field of figurative painting, creating hundreds of portraits and landscapes that hang in more than 750 public and private collections around the world, unquote. What an incredible honor. In fact, you are the only student of Mr. Gamble that I've come across who is a doctor. I'm sure Mr. Gamble would be proud of you. Was your, what was your PhD based on at the University of New Hampshire? Uh, it wasn't based on anything except my lifetime achievements after I left the university. Um, I didn't learn anything from the art department at UNH. And that's the I irony of them giving me this honorary doctorate 45 years later. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it happened. They did do a feature story on me for their magazine one year, and that may have led to some discussion. I don't know, but I understand it was... A, a difficult process to get an honorary doctorate. It's the highest award of academia. And uh, very few um, uh, honorary doctorates of, of fine art are artists. Most of them are uh, uh, movie stars. They're in the entertainment industry rather than in the fine arts. Sure. Um, sure. I'm, I'm the only living master of the Boston School that I know of with an honorary doctorate. The only other uh, honorary doctorate was Edmund Tarbell. I see. And he was so proud of that honorary doctorate that he painted himself in his doctoral robe. Mm -hmm. But I haven't done that, but I'm just pleased. That I'm, I'm just honored to get it because the art department at UNH was basically against what I was trying to do. That's right, yeah. And they, uh, senior year, I criticized the department in a newspaper article. Uh, one of my professors threatened to throw me out of school. I was harassed and bullied. Um, Forty-five years later, they give me an honorary doctorate, the highest award they can. I mean, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> so was that, uh, what did they do? Did they send you a letter? Did they call you up? They, they emailed me at first, then they uh, invited me, of course, to the uh, ceremony. They put my wife and I up in an exclusive inn. Uh, all expenses paid. We have uh, a police escort to the uh, ceremony. There were 25,000 people there. Wow. I was up on stage with uh, one of the uh, only living uh, people with, uh, who are, uh, oh, God, Medal of Honor winners. Mm-hmm. So he, he got an honorary doctorate, and I got an honorary doctorate. That's incredible. And, and yeah, oh, it was wonderful. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm um, suffering from prostate cancer. Um, my PSA numbers went down after I received an honorary doctorate. Mm. So I joke, I joke to people, I need an honorary degree every couple of years. <laughs> so anybody out, anybody out there... Give me an honorary doctor. It'll help to keep my PSA numbers down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Richard, sorry, PSA numbers? What's, uh, what's that? It's the amount of uh, uh, protein from the cancer that's in your system. Oh. But the, amount of, the amount of testosterone you have, uh, a, higher, a higher PSA number indicates the possibility of cancer. I see, I see. Right, right. You know, and you don't you don't have to worry about that yet. You don't you're not old enough. <laughs> uh, and well, I hope not, because if if you get prostate cancer in your forties or fifties, you're in real trouble. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's hard to heal, hard and so forth. I got it uh, uh, when I was about sixty eight. Mm. So on the cusp on the cusp of seventy. Uh, so it, it's and recently they they did a. a PET scan on me, found the cancer on two lymph nodes that they hadn't radiated. So we're going to see if they can do that. And it still may be possible that I can be cured this year. Great. That's great news, Richard. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to pay for the treatments. I've already, it, it's already cost well over $300,000. Wow. That's incredible. And, and you know, if I had, didn't have medical insurance, you know, 
it make you seriously wonder, well, you know, when am I going to leave my family? You know, nothing. That's right. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, how can you do that, you know? Mm -hmm. We're the uh, supposedly richest country in the world, and we have some of the worst health care of any yeah. civilized country. It's that, a disgrace. That, it is, yeah, yeah. Anyway, life is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard, just going back to your... Uh, your accolades. Now, you mentioned that you painted the uh, American actor Ethan Hawke, is that right? That's correct. So how did that come about? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, I was uh, invited to paint uh, Ethan Hawke by the uh, Players Club of New York. Okay. So, so they commissioned the portrait. Um, I did it using co combining a couple of photographs on the internet. I see. And then I sent it down to them and then went to New York for the ceremonies and so forth. Um, he wasn't there. He couldn't make it to the ceremony. There were a number of, of distinguished actors that year that they were honoring with portraits. I think it was the last year they did it. Okay. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very glad that I have a portrait at the Players Club. Great. That's fantastic. Now, being an academic puts you in a position where you can reach influential people in academia and advocate for the relevance of traditional art in our contemporary era. Is this something you have done or perhaps will consider doing one day? Well, I think both of the books that I've published uh, uh, speak to some of that, in that uh, my, one of the first book was on the uh, principles of traditional painting. Mm -hmm. uh, th those fundamental ideas can be applied to art, they can be applied to music. I have a poet friend who uses... Uh, the ideas in the book, um, their ways of thinking about how to solve problems. Sure. Because ultimately you're on your own pretty much as an artist. When you get into trouble, you go back and look at these ideas and that those ideas will help you to solve your problems. That's right. Uh, and the other book is was basically a historical document. Uh, I was, when I... Um, Several circumstances uh, last year um, led to my publishing the letters that I had of Mr. Gamble. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd forgotten that I'd forgotten that I'd had I'd saved every letter that he wrote to me over a period of 17 years, and I came across a stack of something like 70 letters. Um, wow! Fred Ro I Fred Ross had found Gamble's last letter. Yeah. And he had written a, an essay for the Art Renewal Center. I read the essay, and that prompted me to think, yeah, I've got 50, 60, 70 letters here. Maybe I should read them. Mm. So I'm very much into serendipity. Sure. So so I started reading them, and the more I read them, I said, these are extraordinary. And then there were two other developments. Uh, he wrote Twilight of Painting, which is the book that influenced my life in 1946. Mm -hmm. I was born. I was born in 1946. That's right. He wrote these letters to me when he was 72, starting at age 72. I was 72. Wow. So I thought that's what I said. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. I, and and I had a period of time where you know you get to a bunch of commissions, then you get you know it's feast or famine. Mm. It's feast or famine. It seems to be that way, at least for me, rather than a steady uh, supply of sales and so forth. Right. Uh, it was steady for a couple decades, and more recently, especially after the Great Recession, it's been difficult for all artists that I know of. Sure. As well as people in the antiques dealer and so forth. Right. Uh, but um, th those four circumstances told me I really needed to publish these letters. And uh, so I went through all of them at first, and I edited out all the trivia. Mm. Uh, on, only talked about, uh, you know, his ideas on, on painting or art or music and so forth. And my, and my wife said, you know, you edited out all the, you, the minutiae, but the minutiae give you, gives you more... The story of everyday life, it tells more about what Gamble was like. Mm. You, should put it, you should put it back in. So I contacted an art historian friend of mine. He says, 
you really, you, you, you ought to publish it. The best thing to do is publish it as a historic document. Publish every piece of paper you have. Mm. And do not edit it. And so that's what I did. And uh, the book has been very well received. Fantastic. Now, Richard, can I just go back to your uh, honorary doctorate at the University of New Hampshire? When you received the uh, document at the at the ceremony, was there anyone there who were your teachers or perhaps your professors from back uh, when you were a student in in, in the university? Um, only one, Professor Bobek. He was a professor of sociology. We were good friends when I was a student, and uh, we've kept in touch two or three times over the years. Sure. Now, I understand you are equally developed as a landscape artist, mentor, and author. Do you find that mentoring other artists and students, as well as writing on art, to be a healthy break from painting every day, or does it take from your time uh, painting? A very good question. Um, of course, it takes from your time painting, but it is a healthy break. Um, uh, Sid Willis would tell me basically about six to six and a half hours a day is about maximum time, productive time to be painting. Mm. I, I find that to be true, although apparently the great Angra could work 10 hours a day. Uh, I don't know. You know. Painting involves a lot of hard work. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 uh, 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 Thomas Edison was right, you know, uh, inspiration is... You know, it's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Sure, sure. And every day, today, everything is, you know, they encourage people to be easy. You know, just, just let yourself go and create, have fun. Mm. Uh, rather than learning a skill, learning a craft. Um, but, you know, people, people come to me and they want to learn how to paint. I feel it's my obligation to try to teach them what I learned. And and so I, I also, as I'm teaching them, I'm repeating these ideas over and over again. Uh, it drives them further into my mind. It helps me to paint perhaps better. Sure. Now, you mentioned that you've traveled a fair bit throughout your life. Uh, so, in fact, you have traveled and painted commissions in Europe, Japan, Alaska, and the Caribbean. And you have also lectured and conducted workshops throughout the United States. Now, how has travel helped you as an artist? Well, of course, it's um, gotten my name nationally and internationally known, so my reputation, you know, it's helped my reputation. It probably was one factor in my getting an honorary doctorate in that I don't just live here in, in Stoddard, New Hampshire, away from everybody in the world, but I'm engaged in the world, and I do travel, and I do reach out. Sure. Uh, not as much as I used to because I'm older now. I can understand why you need to kind of simplify things. Um, but traveling, of course, opens your awareness to other cultures, other ways of thinking, other kinds of food, other types of art, mm. not just classical painting. Uh, it opens you up to all kinds of things. And, and the wonderful thing about the Internet now is, of course, you can travel without leaving home. That's right. Now, can you just describe your involvement with the American Society of Classical Realism? Uh, I was a board member early on um, and was very happy to be a board member. And I wrote an article for their magazine. Uh, that was sort of my first attempt at writing about uh, the principles of, of traditional painting. And then... Uh, um, um, we had a meeting in Minneapolis. I met the other, other artists who were involved in the society, and I had a, another discussion with Richard Lack. Sure. Now, that would have been an incredible society to be a part of. I imagine, uh, you know, there would have been a lot of discussion regarding uh, not only craft, but, you know, the great masters of the past, uh, you know, ideas related to realism at the time. Can you perhaps, uh, you know, maybe just illustrate a little bit of what it was like to be uh, in one of the society meetings? 
Um, we, we didn't have that many meetings, first of all. Secondly, uh, it was mainly socializing and talking about painting. Um, but at one meeting, there was a discussion about keeping the society quite exclusive. And I spoke up and said that I thought we should uh, invite other artists outside the Boston school tradition to join us. Uh, basically, other wonderful uh, representational painters in this country to join us. I think it would help expand the organization. But my idea was not uh, accepted, and the classical society folded a few years later. Sure. Right. Now, moving on. You married the artist Sandy Sherman in 1999. Sandy is a native of New Hampshire who has been painting in the traditional manner since 1980. I understand she mainly paints still lives using interesting effects of light and color in a style similar to yours. Regarding her training, she has studied with Debbie Crowder and Peter Granucci. She also trained with you for three years. Can you describe the circumstances in which you first met? <laughs> Yes, I can. Um, actually, she is right here. She just came in to say <laughs> hello. Um, but anyway, she studied with me for three years, and uh, uh, she was a very dedicated student. Um, so we got to be friends. And uh, then uh, uh, she was part of Monadnock Studio. She rented space on Mechanic Street, so she had her own studio. So she was there for several years. And over a period of time, we just got to talk to each other more and more, and things happened from there. Sure. It was a long, it was a long period of time before we uh, had a relationship. Sure. Now, I understand Sandy paints figures which she refers to as grotoons. What exactly are these paintings, and what does this term mean? Uh, these, pa these are small paintings of... Uh, uh, 15th or 16th century grotesque figures, but she dresses them up in modern-day costumes with, with modern-day backgrounds. Okay, right. So they're, they're very fanciful sort of paintings, and they're quite popular. Sure, sure. Now, you and Sandy searched for a property to purchase for over a year before deciding to move to Stoddart, where you have set up your home and studio in the woods called Studios at Crescent Pond since 1993. You have access to 81 acres of land with a pond that is situated next to 12,000 acres of conservation forest belonging to the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. Initially, you brought the land not for the house, but for the serene environment it is situated in. Studios at Crescent Pond is today nationally recognized as a backyard wildlife habitat and you have protected the land with a conversation easement. Being surrounded by all this nature daily, must provide you with a wealth of inspiration. Can you provide more information regarding your home in Crescent Pond? Uh, yes, um, it's uh, nature lover's paradise. Uh, Thoreau would have been very jealous. <laughs> um, our pond is much more beautiful than Walden Pond. <laughs> um, we have access to thousands of acres of forest. Of course, he did back then, but we've We've had a far more experiences with wildlife here than he ever had. Mm -hmm. But uh, people who come here are just uh, love the environment and love to visit us not only to see the art but also to to see our surrounding property. Sure. Um, now that's <laughs> sorry. Go on, Richard. Yeah, it's a wildlife. Uh, Lover's Paradise, we've seen all kinds of animals here, uh, beavers, uh, black bears especially. Wow. And, and that's been a, quite a thing. Uh, for several years, I did some, I fed some black bears, and it was called diversionary feeding. Mm -hmm. uh, because, because we're in the forest perimeter, if you feed black bears when they come out of hibernation in the forest, they don't go into the village and bother people. Oh, I see. So I did that for a while, and I get to have some personal experiences with a few bears that were quite profound. So that was an area of my life that I've never expected to be a, uh, um, a bear whisperer. 
<laughs> it never, it never occurred to me, but it was a thrilling experience, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Sure. And I've seen a few paintings of bears uh, on the internet floating around that you've created in the past as well. Um, I, I wasn't aware that they're on the internet, but I'm happy that they are. <laughs> Now, studios at Crescent Pond occasionally host artist workshops and gallery exhibits. Why do you feel a need to do this? Well, we have to reach out. I mean, we have to earn a living and you have to get known. Uh, it's good also to talk with other artists, um, to share experiences, uh, get some in inspiration, and to get some encouragement. Sure. Um, it's it's bringing the world to us, right? And I think I think these days, with the internet and so forth, that's very very possible. Sure. I, um, I remember reading about uh, uh, Goya. Mm -hmm. uh, the the more famous, uh, you know, after a while he he became very reclusive. Yes, and the more, and the more reclusive it got, ironically, the more famous he got. Yeah, and that's happened with me. That's incredible. Um, you know, a good day is when I don't have to leave here. Yeah, period. sure, sure. Yeah, uh, it's so beautiful looking, walking outside. I mean, it it takes your breath away. Um, I can walk through the woods. We have two miles of trails. We have uh, it's beautiful canoeing. Uh, in hiking, mm -hmm. uh, so it, and also uh, having studied in the cities and so forth, I wasn't aware how how much noise there is. In a sense, uh, mm. even even music is noise. Sure. Compared to absolute quiet, and you're listening to the wind and the birds. Beautiful. Um, I understand. Certainly, I, I miss I miss Boston for movies. I mean, for the theater, uh, for the uh, symphony or operas. I miss Boston for the restaurants, but I don't miss it for uh, in the museums. I don't miss it for the noise, mm. the chaos. I mean, when you're young, it's fun to have chaos. You know, you want to stay up till two in the morning and party, things like that. When you get older, you want peace and quiet. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it really seems like, Richard, that your surroundings, I mean, Studios at Crescent Pond, is a place where you can really find the peace to create your work uh, as a painter, especially in your, in your latter years. Uh, and have you found that, uh, you know, when you were in Boston, perhaps, that the busyness and, and the world going on around you uh, sometimes affected your ability to just slow down and really concentrate on painting? I thought the art, uh, the atmosphere in Boston was sort of counter counterproductive. Yes, exactly that. Um, I didn't like it. There was not much camaraderie among artists. Uh, um, Mr. Gamble did not encourage his students to be great friends with each other. Um, we all, most of us were kind of more mistrustful of each other. Mm -hmm. We were we were sort of competitors. You know, he was he would very freely critique my work in front of the other students in a very personal manner sometimes, and vice versa, which I think is out of line. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Artists are sensitive people, and sometimes if you say things publicly, uh, you can do some serious damage for a long period of time. And I saw that happen to some of his students. Um, so uh, I, I try to, you know, when I teach, I try to be very positive. I know Richard Lack produced a lot more painters because he was very positive. Mm. I also understand, I believe, it's my impression that as Mr. Gamble got older, uh, his last years, he, he mellowed a bit because he had had a heart attack or a couple of heart attacks and he was hit by an automobile. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those uh, um, events that brush, brushes with death may have calmed him down and... I think he may have been nicer and happier 
near the end of his life. Sure. I didn't experience that, unfortunately, whenever I met him. But uh, but I understand from other students later on that he was almost a different person. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Once in a while, he would still explode, but he was not like he was earlier in his life. He had definitely, he had definitely mellowed. Sure. Now, the painter's life can be somewhat of a lonely existence at times, especially if the majority of your work is created in the studio. To outsiders, being an artist working quietly in your little bubble can seem like you're retreating from the world. Therefore, one can get relegated to the title of an outsider. As Mr. Gamel states, quote, Only a boy who has painting in his bones, who feels the irresistible urge which can be curbed only at the cost of great unhappiness and frustration, would stick to it in these conditions. That boy sticks because he has to, as another sacrifices opportunities, families, and friends to marry the girl he feels he has to marry." Unquote. Through this quote, we get a sense of the seriousness Mr. Gamble expected his students to have over learning their craft. However, sometimes it can be challenging for other people to see eye to eye with the painter, not understanding that what you do is more than simply a hobby, but rather a way of life. As Mr. Gamble further states, quote, the nature of painting, its particular problems and difficulties, even its deeper purpose remain incomprehensible to the uninitiated, unquote. In saying this, what has it been like sharing your life with another painter who understands your needs to paint? I'm fortunate that uh, Sandy is a very gifted artist herself. She has a great eye for design. I mean, her eye is fabulous for design. She can throw things together in a few minutes that would take me hours or whatever to put together. That, that's her great gift. And also her eye is superb. Um, and, uh, you know, she's a highly trained painter. She was just uh, honored as a living master from the, by the Art Renewal Center. So we were very proud of that. Um, I, when she, I'm working on a painting, she'll come in, take a look, maybe point something out that she thinks needs to be worked on. Or sometimes it's something that I had not thought about. Once in a while, it's something I say, no, that's uh, no, you're wrong, and so forth. And I have to think about it a while and realize, yeah, she's got a point. Mm. So uh, it, it's good to have uh, another painter with, with a trained eye who can help, help you to uh, do your best work. Sure. Moving forward, today it is estimated you, that you have created some 400 portraits and 400 landscapes. Do you consider your finest work te technically to be Portrait of Deborah, which is a portrait of your oldest daughter when she was 16 years old, painted in 1986? It was painted completely from life, which took 45 sittings. I understand you placed her clothing on a mannequin, which took you a month and a half to paint. You spent three days painting the necklace of pearls. Can you reminisce what it was like to actually paint the portrait and why you consider it to be your finest technical achievement? Uh, well, I painted both my daughters, both Deborah and Emily. Emily's portrait is almost as good, uh, very close to being as good, but it was stolen from a gallery in North Carolina, so uh. we've, we haven't seen it. But hopefully the person who has it has taken good care of it. But uh, these are my children. Um, I love them. I wanted to show that in my painting. Um, my daughter Deborah is smiling at me with, with love in her smile. And I'm trying to convey that to the viewer, and I think I was very successful in doing so. Um, I'm not aware of a better open smile portrait than that one. Um, I agree with that, Richard. That's a, yeah, it's an incredible... I, I don't, I don't, know if anyone, I don't know if anyone has done that. Um, in other words, at times, you know, I, I've, I, I, I view painting like baseball. Mm. Um, much of the time you strike out. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, you, you, hopefully occasionally you get a single. Once in a while a double. Occasionally a triple. And once in a great while a home run. Mm. 
Uh, I think painting's the same way. Um, one thing that drives me nuts about looking through art books is the person who put the art book together has no eye about what's good or what's bad. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no sense of discrimination. You see some piece of crap by a great artist next to a masterpiece. Mm. Uh, Miss, uh, when Paxton died, Mrs. Paxton, Elizabeth Paxton, and Mr. Gamble went through Paxton's paintings that were left in his home and threw out paintings that they considered inferior. Wow, is that right? That's right. In other words, the weak work, throw it out. Um, because books will come along and they will, perhaps they don't know what they're, they don't, they don't know a good painting from a bad painting. And uh, I've done the same thing. I've thrown out, oh God, dozens of paintings over the years. Wow. Um, you know, anything that I haven't sold is still here. I, I, I've gone through it and sifted things out. Um, regarding my portrait of Deborah, um, I painted, I was trained to paint from life. Uh, much that you're going to talk about this later, but much of the time with portrait painting, you have to work in photographs. But I had my daughter sit for the portrait. Uh, it was not all that pleasant for her. Um, uh, once in a while, she would kind of giggle and so forth, and I'd get very upset because I was so intent on getting it perfect. Mm. So it was, it was, I was a demanding uh, uh, artist when I painted her because I tried so hard to do my very best work. Mm -hmm. and, and when I put in the clothing... I sort of put it in in a sort of a sergeant sort of style. And I looked at it, and I said, you know, I, I really, it needs to be more delicate than that. The whole sense of, the whole sense of the poem, the, po the painting is it's very delicate. Mm -hmm. It's very poetic. So I essentially photographed the detail with a tiny brush. I went in and painted every little stitch of that damn dress. <laughs> and then I went over the entire dress again, eliminating the tail, eliminating what I didn't see when I looked at her as a unit, as a whole thing. I eliminated mm. a lot of the tail. And that took a month, a month and a half. Wow. But, you know, it's, it's like, you know, these paintings are for me. They will go to them. My daughter, Deborah, and unfortunately, Emily, Emily's painting is not going to go to her. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody out there finds it and lets us, let us know about it. Sure. Now, the, the pearls in the painting, Richard, are just exquisitely painted. I mean, how did you go about treating that treatment of getting the pearls so, uh, so real, so to speak? One, one by one by one. Photograph it with a tiny brush, as Sergeant said, and then try to simplify it down. But sergeant got to be, uh, you know, later sergeants got to be such. It was a slash with a dark note underneath and then dot, 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 dot mm. on top pearls. And that was it. Uh, you know, he took two minutes doing it rather than two hours. Sure. Um, and I decided that my approach to painting both my daughters, Deborah and, and Emily, would be very academic as well as a bit impressionist. Sure. Is it? You know what I'm saying, but mainly academic in the sense that the when you walk walk in and look at the detail, you can get black pressure pleasure looking at the detail as you just did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, Richard, just going back to uh, Mr. Paxton and his works that were thrown out, uh, how many works do you think it's estimated that were destroyed of his of his earlier career? I have no idea. Right. No but, idea at all. Sure. It was it was, it was in his entire career, whatever had not been sold, they went through the, that the, that collection. That must have been a lot of paintings. I can imagine uh, possibly a couple hundred. Wow. I don't know. I really don't know. I have no idea. Sure. But I know that he specifically told me about it, uh, because you know he said it's important to you know get rid of the junk, get rid of the strikeouts. Mm -hmm. You know, Babe Ruth is known for, you know, the, the greatest home, home run hitter. Mm -hmm. he, he struck out more than, 
more than anybody else also. Yeah, sure. Now, do we, now do we historically focus on his strikeouts? No, we we love him for being a home run hitter, an unlikely candidate. Right. By the way, he was you know a wild person, not terribly athletic in the sense of looking at him, mm. but he he had a, a, you know a, a, an enormous talent to be able to hit that ball out of the park. Sure. Moving forward. Richard Lack had this to say about your work, quote, All of your portraits saw a fine instinct feel, instinctive feeling for character and expression, unquote. What was the situation in, this, in which this quote was stated? Well, Mr. I had sent uh, a number of photographs of my portraits to Mr. Gamble, and he, in, in the letter that you read in the book, a read in the book, he, he basically trashed them. Mm. So I sent him. I sent him to Richard Lack, and he. This. That's what he said. I find instinctive feeling for character and expression. Um, and that was a encouraging remark, rather than oh, you know, you, you don't know how to paint. You're going to be a failure. Yeah, sure. Now, was of that... course, you're, of course, you're going to be a failure if you hear that all the time. Absolutely. And you have to get away from that sort of environment, and that's what I did. Sure. Now, were you standing besides Mr. Lack when he um, stated that passage to you? No, it was in a letter. Oh, in a letter. Okay, sure. Can you recall the first time you met Richard Lack and include any quotes or paraphrases from parts of your discussion? That would be basically at a meeting uh, in Minneapolis uh, when the board members of the American uh, Society of Classical Realism got together. Um, until then, we had corresponded by letter. Um, unfortunately, I could not find Richard Lack's letters. I've looked all over the place for them because I wanted to, if possible, put them in this book as well mm. uh, because they, they, they did concern principles of painting and so forth that could be very helpful, but uh, I couldn't find them. But... Um, he was always very kind to me. Um, he was very insistent that the Classical Realism Society be strictly Boston School painters, which I thought was a terrible mistake. And I believe it turned out to be a very bad mistake because the organization no longer exists. That's right, yeah. But I did not win my argument that time. But Sure. Um, yeah. What is the single most important piece of advice he gave you? To leave Mr. Gamble when I felt I had to leave him and to never give up and so forth, to keep, to find my own way of painting, uh, to keep going, that I had sufficient knowledge to pretty much make it on my own, uh, not to worry. I, I wrote to him that, you know, I could not go and study with him. He said it probably was not necessary, that I was advanced enough that I would be fine on my own. Okay. Now, can you comment on the relationship that Mr. Gamble and Mr. Lack shared? Well, Richard Lack was one of Gamble's first students, and as, as you mentioned before, when he got married, he that was a big uh, source of disagreement between him and Mr. Gamble. But eventually, Mr. Gamble accepted the relationship, uh, although I understand from Catherine Lack that Gamble gave them a very hard time. Mm. Um, and in Lack's, Lack wrote to me, back to me, his advice to leave Mr. Gamble. He said, after a couple of years, the atmosphere turns somewhat destructive. And if you stay there long enough, Mr. Gamble will essentially take over your whole life, your personality, and so forth. He may not mean to do that but that's his personality he, Gamble was such a bulldog such a force of nature he just rolled over people all the time I just saw it I mean it, he may not even have meant to do that mm. I, I'm, I'm trying to be generous here sure um, but that happened to be a fact right do you believe Mr. Gamble despised Mr. Lack after he developed a name for himself and started training students of his own? 
I, I had never heard that he despised Mr. Lack. Um, Mr. Gamble went with me to a show of Richard Lack's paintings where he occasionally put things down and said, oh, he could have learned more, he left too early. Um, I think he said that with most all of his students. Right, uh, so, so when... It, it, may, it, it may be that Mr. Gamble was so lonely in a sense that you know he wanted these students around him, but at the same time, his personality was so strong that you had to be a very strong have a very strong personality yourself to survive. And most, you know, 20, 18, 20, 22 year old uh, young men, you know, don't have that. Mm. Now, when Richard Lack went on to develop Atelier Lack, uh, did you ever recall Mr. Gamble bringing that up or any discussions where he uh, stated his opinion on, on, on Mr. Lack actually getting out there and, and establishing a school of his own and uh, a name of his own uh, and training his own painters. He never he never mentioned anything about that. Uh, he didn't mention anything like that to me. Sure. No. Why do you think Mr. Lack had the capacity to touch so many people's lives? He was positive most of the time. He was positive rather than negative. Mm. Uh, um, as he says, you know, all of your portraits show a fine, instinctive feeling for character and expression. That's a wonderful compliment sure. from a from a masterful painter, someone I greatly admired mm -hmm. you know, for years. And for a person like that to uh, say something about my work means a great deal to me. Uh, it's worth far more than hundreds of comments from, you know, tons of people about, oh, you do beautiful work. I mean, that's nice to hear, but to have another very accomplished artists say very good things about your work. That's the, those, those are the highest compliments. Absolutely. Pietro Anagoni had this to say about you. Quote, I much appreciate your work. Your drawing is good, and so is the modeling. In your portraits, there is character and life. Unquote. Did you meet Mr. Anagoni during his lifetime? Uh, yes, I did. When I was in wow. Florence. Yeah, I got to spend uh, uh, half a day with Mr. Any goni. That's incredible. I didn't know that. Yeah, great. That was great. Um, when I met him, he was, well, I went to his studio and uh, it looked like he hadn't slept in a couple of days. He was very unshaven. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was doing a series of these uh, uh, paintings of dummies in various positions. Yeah, the mannequins, yeah, yeah. Mannequins. And I didn't really think very highly of him, uh, of those paintings. And I know I went into his private quarters and there's his self portrait that he did, you know, very similar to in a Holbein sort of style. Yeah. 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 And then there's a pencil drawing of, of a, of a, a, a dark skinned man in a profile, uh, with, uh, great hair. Um, and an, another drawing of um, Bernard Berenson. Mm -hmm. Basically, three of the very, very top, best, most beautifully crafted pieces that he ever did in his life. Yeah. In, in his studio. Wow. In his, when, in, in his inner sanctum for himself. Outside, he's doing this, I would say, crap uh, dummies. Uh, yeah. It, it, it was beneath him. Yeah. But the great, the great man knew himself, you know, this is what I could do. Um, you know, my portrait of my father and Deborah and, and Sandy are here in my studio. Part, nobody's going to see him partly because my portrait of Emily was stolen. I can't bear to lose any other portraits of my family members. Mm. But also I can look at that and say, yeah, I did that. Absolutely. It, it, gives, it gives me encouragement to keep going is what I'm saying. Sure. And I, not, and I noticed Annie Goni did the same thing. Mm -hmm. in, his, in his own inner sanctum, he displayed his very, very best work. Sure. So what were some of the things you spoke about when you spent that half a day with him? Uh, he said, you know, making a living as an artist was very, very difficult. He didn't really recommend it to most people. Uh, um, I, 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 meant, I remember very little about 
other things that he spoke about that time. Um, I did not bring a portfolio of my work at that time. Mm -hmm. I, w I had just left Mr. Gamble, and I was in a very depressed mood, as you I think you will talk about later on. Mm -hmm. And I felt I was a, you know, basically sort of a failure as a painter. Sure. So, so the following year, my friend Sandy Lochner brought a portfolio of my work to Antigone to see, and that's where he was very praiseworthy. Sure. And is that where that quote comes from, or was that yes, something? That, that's okay. correct, yes. Did he write that down, or did he just tell it to Sandy? He, he told that to Sandy. Sandy wrote it down. Oh, okay. Great, great. Moving forward, in 2009, you painted the future Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney. This portrait stands at 52 by 37 inches and took you a total of 150 hours to paint. However, it is somewhat different to other portraits of Commonwealth governors as it contains a picture of Romney's wife. I understand this caused some problems for you when you submitted a sketch to the official portrait committee for approval. They were against the idea of including the picture of Romney's wife as well as a leather-bound document on the desk the cover of which, which which was embossed with a gold symbol of the caducus, which is related to medicine, as Mr. Romney wanted to include it, as it represents the landmark Massachusetts health care bill that he signed into law in 2006. It seems like this was a wonderful, uh, sorry, excuse me, it seems like this was a somewhat controversial portrait. Can you expand on the series of events that surrounded the creation of the portrait and what the final outcome was? Well, it was Romney's wish that his wife's picture be somewhere in the portrait. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a, a photo, of, you know, I was going to paint a photo of a framed photo on his desk. Yeah. So he had a fo photo of uh, Mrs. Romney and uh, her, she was smiling at me, but of course it was til tilted at the wrong angle. I had to we, we tilted to make it right and so forth. But I submitted the study, the sketch to the committee um, and they, I, they contacted me, they, you, know, you, you can't do this, you can't have his wife in the portrait, it's never been done. Mm -hmm. So I told Mr. Romney this and he said, he went to the, or talked to the committee and he said, I'm paying for this portrait, I will have what I want. Wow. And I, I, that's what I said is, wow. And he also said that, you know, to them that his wife was very, very important in his success as a human being. Absolutely. She, she, she deserves to be in the portrait. Absolutely. And, and I thought I thought the committee, basically, they were a bunch of idiots, mm. frankly. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, this was 2009. This is 2009 when there was some talk of him running for president. And he was very, very proud of, of this, his landmark health care bill, which is basically Obamacare. Okay. It's the, same, it's the same thing as Obamacare. Yeah. Now, when he ran for president three or four years later, after I, long after I painted his portrait, he put down his health care bill and he, he ridiculed the idea of of the health care bill. Mm. He was listening to, I think he was getting very, very bad advice. The, the His right wing advisors were saying, you know, you, you take this position and said, instead and you'll win the election. And I thought that was stupid. I mean, here here he is, the first governor in the, in the entire United States to do anything about the health care mess we're in. Yeah. He did, he did something. Now, I, I did paint the uh, chairman of Mass General Hospital, mm -hmm. and I asked him how was Romney Care working out. He said uh, it was working out very well. It needed a couple tweaks here and there, but in, on the whole, it was much much better than what they had before. It just needed a couple more tweaks, which is what Obama's been saying for years, and what the you know the Republicans want to throw the whole thing out and put people on the street, basically, without health care. Mm. Uh, it's a very sad thing that's yeah. going on. It's very sad what's happening in this country right now. Sure. 
So um, what what was the outcome of the uh, of the portrait, uh, Richard? Did the the committee allow you to go ahead and include the the picture of uh, Mr. Romney's yes. wife? Yes, yes, they did, and uh, there was an unveiling ceremony in Boston. Um, it was interesting. It was filled with hundreds of Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. both, both parties. And in Mr. Romney's speech. He said that he all, he never asked for anyone's party affiliation. He just was looking for the best people for the best job. And I still maintain Romney would have been a great president of the United States. Uh, I think it's very, very sad that he started saying some stupid things that I know, having been with him a while, I don't think he really believed. Right. He was just saying those things because the so-called political experts were telling him this is how you win. And it's a tragedy for this, this country that a man like that did not become president. Sure. It was, it was clear at the time, the Democrats and the Republicans, they all loved him. Mm. Everybody, everybody cheered. The portrait was a great success. And when he ran for, pub, for president... Um, it was going to be shown at the Republican National Convention on, on national television. Mm -hmm. And along comes Hurricane Sandy. Arr. So that canceled the uh, first uh, day of the convention. And it, of course, it canceled showing this portrait. Um, but it was shown on several national media sites. Mr. Romney was very generous in giving me a lot of publicity. Um, and I, I'm grateful for that. And uh, it was also a, a meme. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, the, um, the uh, reporter in California, um, I, forget her name, I forget her name at the moment, but people would vote on it. You know, what, what did you think of the portrait? And it was, it was fun to read these comments. I mean, oh, Whitney is a great master. Oh, the portrait's a piece of crap. Mm. Or blah, blah, blah. You know, it depended on whether you were Republican or Democrat. Yeah, yeah. Whether you liked it or hated it. Mm -hmm. So that was funny, uh, but but it was a great experience. I mean, it was it was it was a wonderful thing to to do. Absolutely, and and I would imagine imagine it would have, as you've mentioned, br brought you so much uh, media attention and publicity. Great for your career. It didn't bring me any commissions. No commissions. No, no, not, not not specifically due to that portrait. Okay, but rather, but rather commissions due to my general reputation. It may have expanded my reputation a lot over throughout the country. That's sure. true. Sure. In regards to your process for painting commission portraits, you usually will speak by telephone or email with the client to determine the details of the portrait. This includes desired mood, size, clothing, objects to be included in the portrait, schedules, and where the portrait will ultimately hang. Regarding the portrait painting process, you usually take photographs of your sitter and paint a color study from life. You then work with the client to reach an agreement on the final pose and composition. However, you usually also have the client pose for a final session where you finish the portrait from life. Can you, can you elaborate on this process and explain more so what each step involves? Well, the, part of the first step is uh, getting to know the client. Um, so if I have to travel somewhere, like I recently went to Ohio, I met with the person, had dinner with him and his wife, got to know them a bit, and then had the sitting the next day. Now, while, he, while at dinner and so forth, we're breaking ice, we're getting to know each other, he gets more relaxed, okay? Mm -hmm. and, that, and as he's relaxing, I notice how he holds his head, how he, you know, what sort of expression he use, is his usual expression, uh, how he holds his hands, etc. And I try to employ that in the sitting the next day. I try to remember how he, how he is posed, how, how he naturally carries himself. Yeah. So that when somebody looks at his portrait, says, "Yeah, that's Joe. You know, that's him. Spitting image. Uh, you know, that's just like him. That he wears that tie and that, that those glasses, whatever. Yes, absolutely. My, portrait, my portraits. I try to capture their personality, and that's one way of doing it. Um, 
whenever possible, I try to work from life. Once in a great while, I'll have a sitter come here and have the time, take the time, and I'll paint the whole thing right here from life. But it doesn't happen that much anymore. Yeah, yeah. And it, working from photographs, in some respects, is harder. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I agree. Yeah, because, because you're only you're seeing what a camera sees, which is different from your, what your eyes see. Yeah, sure. And um, you know, unless you have done some painting, you you don't understand that. And I, I can make it far more realistic and alive. Uh, if I have a life sitting than if I'm just working from a, port, a photograph. Sure. However, yeah. however I, will, I will say having painted hundreds of portraits, I can fake it pretty good. Yeah, sure. You've experienced, um, you've experienced so much that I, you can bring it into the actual uh, photograph. I, I, can, I can make it more alive than a photograph anyway, okay. period. Right. Whether, I've seen the, whether I see the person or not, my ultimate image is much more attractive than than the, the photograph. Fantastic. But it takes but it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Sure. Do you believe that using photographs is appropriate for painting commission portraits in our day and age? That seems to be the way things are done. Uh, you know, it's more important for today's CEOs to spend time on the golf course than, it, than sitting for. The artist. <laughs> That's true. Uh, in, the, in the 19th century, it was part. Well, first of all, photography wasn't around that much. So, actually, before the invention of photography, the only way your face could be remembered is through the artist's skill as a painter. Yeah, right. Uh, with the invention of photography, uh, World War One, killing off uh, half of civilization in a sense, the art world went through a revolution. Um, all the old ideas were thrown out, the new ideas, you know, do what you want, uh, any, anything goes, uh, the world, life is meaningless, we're all going to die, blah, 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 blah. Those things infected the arts. Absolutely. Ch it changed things. Um, using, port using photographs. When I visited the first commission I got from Vos Gowies was a paint portrait of a couple from Iran. He was a cultural minister of culture of Iran. Uh -huh. it, was a, it was a color photograph of him and his wife. Now, if I had said to Bill Vos, I can only work from life. I need 20 sittings. It's the only way I can do my, my, my work successfully. My career would have been over. Right, yeah. Right? Right then and there, my career would have been over as it was for other artists who studied with him, some of the other artists who studied with him. Sure. Uh, you have to accept reality. Wherever, whenever you have an ideal situation, put everything into it that you can. When you're working from a photograph, um, if the painting has real potential, put everything you have into it. If you don't, if you don't have, think it has potential, whack that thing out as fast as you can and get paid for it. Sure. Rembrandt, Rembrandt, keep, Rembrandt always said, and Gamble quotes this, keep the pot boiling. Yeah, right, right. You know, and Sid Willis said, make your living with the brush. Mm. Doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you're painting. You, you want to paint a landscape, but you're painting a, a, a still life or whatever. He said, it doesn't matter what you're painting. The thing is you're practicing eye-hand coordination. You're practicing how to manipulate the brush to get the effects you want. And it takes years of coordination to be any good at it. Sure. It's interesting. Mr. Lack had some great advice when it came to painting posthumous portraits from a photograph, which I believe he referred to as debtors. His advice was to not spend too long working on them as it would be almost impossible to do a perfect job working from a photo. Do you side with Mr. Lack's theory? I Basically, yes. Uh, unless the photograph is done by someone with a very good eye and is of very high quality, then you have a chance to make something of it. Um, once in a great while, I get a, a debtor, but the photograph is terrific. I'm very fortunate, then I push it as far as I can. 
Mm -hmm. If the photograph isn't that great, I try to whack that thing out as fast as I can without losing the quality. And it's possible to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and get paid for it and, and go on with it. You know, it's going to be one of my uh, singles or whatever. It's not going to mean much to me. Sure. You know, I'm I'm in there baseball. I want I want the home runs or the, or the RBIs. Right. Now it's interesting hearing the uh, the aphorism debtors and, and Mr. Lack was really famous for that coming up with all these uh, aphorisms to explain concepts related to painting. Uh, do you recall any uh, aphorisms perhaps that Mr. Gamel or Lack used uh, whilst you knew them? Well. I'm Mr. D Mr. Gamow referred to the uh, uh, memorial portraits as debtors as well. Okay, right. Um, so he always said debtors. Um, I would probably say he would side with Mr. Lack's theory. Mm -hmm. um, I know at the very, very beginning of my career, you know, the idea, well, every work you do the best, you, 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 you spend as long on every work as possible, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's nice, but choose your battles. Here again, choose your battles. Lack is right. Choose your battles. Spend only a, only your longest period of time on works that you really feel are going to make something. Right? They're going to be something. They're going to be home runs. Sure. Make them make them home runs, and then make them grand slams. Mm -hmm. Work to death on them. Whatever. Go as far as you can with them. Do the agonize over it. And sooner or later, you'll get to a state where you get to ecstasy. You say, "Yeah, this is very good." Mm. If 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 Van Dyke or Velasquez or Rubens came to my studio, they'd have something positive to say about it. Sure. You know, if, if Picasso came to my studio, I wouldn't give a damn what he said. Mm. Now, in the past, you have stated that quote, "Watching me paint can be kind of like watching grass grow." because most of the paintings I do take weeks or months of work and it's a very slow process. I'm not someone that paints a picture, one picture a day. Those things I consider are simply sketches. Most all major works of art take a very long time to do. There's just no other way of doing it." Unquote. Do you ever become impatient with the process of painting considering how long it takes to resolve a picture? Or is this something that you have made peace with at this point in your life? I've never made peace with it completely. Um, yeah, I wish in a way that I were a photog photographer instead, yeah. filmmaker, whatever. Um, hell of a lot easier. Uh, but it's it's part of the whole thing. I mean, to do something, to do a painting that's really beautiful takes time. Now, once in a while, you can do a sketch which has a lot of those elements in it. Uh, but you need to take a sketch once in a while you need to do a painting that way you spend all your time on it if you think it's going to be a major subject spend a lot of time on it and if you get tired go out and do two or three quick sketches for your mental health um vary it back and forth yeah now regarding a painter's training the 19th century english painter john constable had this to say quote the young painter who, regardless of present popularity, would leave a name behind him, must become the patient pupil of nature. What uh, what are the most sublime productions of the brush, but selections of some of the forms of nature and copies of a few of her evanescent effects? And this is the result, not of inspiration, but of long and patient study under the direction the direction of much good sense. Unquote. Constable's idea of becoming a patient pupil of nature aligns with your own views on training painters. Your recommendation for them is to, quote, start out with cast drawing exactly as Gamble suggested, simple casts. Focus on how to see the shape. You don't need to spend two weeks learning how to tone the background. Gamble never had us working months and months on a cast drawing, unquote. Again, working for months on cast drawings is a common practice in today's ateliers and academies. What do you think the drawbacks are of spending such a length of time on a single cast drawing? Oh, you get bored to death. Uh, it dulls your artistic uh, inspiration, I think. It's, it's not necessary. Mm. 
I, uh, you want to be able to, you want to be able to draw things quickly, not slowly. Uh, you want to be able to capture that the look of that person when he's smiling like that in a, in a few minutes, not 20, 20 days or two weeks. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, if you get in the habit of working months on a cast drawing or, or a painting, then you go out into real life. Uh, real life is not like that. Um, mm. gal galleries want you to turn out paintings quickly. Most of them do. Uh, they're not particularly... Uh, fond of handling work if it takes months of time to do it. Sure. No, that's that's good advice as well. And the the, uh, the drawings as well can sometimes become uh, overworked or perhaps overlabored if uh, you know an ex extended period of time is is, is taken uh, to complete the work. And that initial uh, the essence or perhaps gesture of the work can sometimes become come lost as well. That's correct. Um, it, you know, it's it. Yes, once in a while you need to spend a long time on something, but I don't think it's necessary to render a cast drawing to spend a week toning the background. Yeah, right. Yes, yes, okay. So the paper's lousy. Spend maybe two days at the most on it, and then get on to something else or whatever. You know, you can shorten the process. You can get the general idea of it without noodling every little tiny infinite piece of detail sure um, there's sort of a middle approach there I think from one extreme is to do a hundred sketches one after the other just do quick sketches the other extreme is just do very laborious works I think there's a, a mixture a middle middle uh, middle point a middle viewpoint absolutely Richard, can I ask as well? Uh, and I know I know this uh, particular uh, practice wasn't around back in your day of training, but uh, the Charles Barg drawing course, the one that he he, he created in collaboration with Jean Lair and Jerome, those plates are really popular now in a lot of the contemporary schools. Uh, what's your opinion on them? Uh, they're wonderful things to copy to work from, uh, but here again, I wouldn't spend months on them. Not months on a single one. I don't think I don't think you learn that much after a while. Mm. Um, I, I think you need to learn how to grasp things quickly, because nature nature doesn't hold still like that for months at a time. Right. Especially especially landscape painting. You need to train your visual memory, your memory for colors, for general effects, and so forth. Uh, and that's you know that's really what you're aiming to do, uh, not to just sit down and day after day, hour after hour, tone the background. I mean, that's crap. Right. In regards to beginner students learning color, you recommended creating little landscape studies as you go on to state, quote, when the lighting effect is happening, stop whatever you're doing and let the color and values of those big masses. When the effect is not happening, work on the drawing of the scene. If after doing dozens of small studies you find a scene you really love, render the living hell out of it. Spend a month, a month and a half on it. Work on it. Labor it. Over labor on it and force yourself to see it as accurately as you can in terms of color, shape and everything else. Push it to the limit. Do that with one or two paintings each year. Those are your calling cards, the things you show in national exhibits to get awards. The rest of the stuff you do to sell to try to earn a living." Unquote. Now this is great advice. I'd imagine that such an approach would require the student to rely on painting parts of the landscape from memory. Would that be correct? Absolutely. Uh, Dennis Bunker would paint landscapes only if the day, it, either sunny days that were clear, clear days or sunny, sunny hazy days or completely cloudy days. Uh, he probably later in his life, I'm sure, would have experimented with uh, different uh, effects of, of cloud patterns going over the landscape or, or momentary effects, let's say, at sunset, which last only a, a minute or two to capture. Um, but that's done over a period of time. You try to train your memory for these things because nature uh, only gives you hints especially landscape painting. painting. Uh, the light changes every few minutes, every 
oftentimes uh, every few seconds. Um, a landscape that I did recently here at, this, at the pond, uh, it was early spring with the buds just coming out on the trees. And it was about 7.30 in the morning. I was looking out, walking around, and I saw this effect. effect. <clears throat> the wind had just started to blow. And it just barely disturbed the surface of the reflection of the water in this, it's like, pointillistic effect. Mm. Um, it broke up the, the reflection of these trees in the beautiful spring colors into this little pointillist, pointillistic effect. Sure. It sure. only lasted two or three seconds. It was gone. I never saw it again. Right, right. That, be, that became the basis of my painting. Yeah, uh, right. And I spent a you know, month, I, I memorized what I saw. I spent probably a month and a half at least in the studio on the painting. And I was very proud of it because I, I, I captured that beauty. Sure. So it's, it's important, uh, in, from what I understand from what you're saying, to not merely just copy what's before you, but to, to almost take a snapshot in your mind of, of a moment of where the light is perfect, uh, where the, 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 the composition is perfect, uh, and then to reproduce that in your own painting. Um, things are seldom perfect, and eventually you develop, a, when you're skillful enough, then you start to figure out how to edit nature the way you want everybody to see it. Sure. So that my painting of a landscape would not be photographically correct every little leaf it'd be very close it would be like the thing as tarbell used to say mm, mm. but it would be my vision of it where you know this tree it needs a branch over here the, it, you know, i need a cloud over here uh i need to move this tree over there etc cetera, etc cetera. right and that's what you're doing as an artist you're rearranging things to make it better Sure. To make it more beautiful, to make it more beautiful, more expressive. Yeah, more more beautiful than reality, essentially. A prior student of yours who has gone on to become a very successful painter is Michael Klein. I understand he trained with you for two years, beginning when he was only nineteen. Do you recall his development under your watchful eye, and was he a student that you identified early on as having something special? Uh, I certainly was aware that he had something special. Um, he was certainly very advanced. I didn't have to tell him that much. Um, it, was, it was just fun to see him develop without my having to really explain too much. He was very gifted. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I knew that he, would make some, he was going to be a painter. There was no question about it. Right. Do you still keep in touch with uh, Michael these days? I haven't heard from him in several years. I'd like to hear from him. Sure. Uh, I've seen his work once in a while, but I, I have not been in touch with him. Mm -hmm. And what, what is your opinion of his work now that he's developed? Well, he's, he's very fine at what he does. He's very good. Oh, yeah. He's very, very competent. Absolutely. Um, Perhaps one of the finest floral still life painters in the world. Entirely possible, yes. Another piece of advice you've given that is very resourceful states, quote, choose your battles. You don't have to finish everything you ever start. If it's just not working out, throw it away, unquote. It can be tremendously disheartening when one has labored on a painting or drawing for a length of time, only to find that it's not going to work out. At this point in your life, are you able to determine early on whether a painting will work out or not? Uh, pretty much. Um, if it's not, work not working, I throw it out, I start over. Um, I have a good sense of whether it's going to work or not, yes. Okay, great. It's interesting reading of a conversation that you had with another of Mr. Gamble's students named Sam Rose, who has now passed on, I understand. He told you that the majority of the academic painters whose work we hold in high esteem came from wealthy families or married into one. There were, however, a number of them who worked their way to the top because they were also knowledgeable businessmen. Now, this is really great advice. A lot of artists 
are shy and introverted and therefore aren't that all go outgoing when it comes to promoting their work, what do you think being a good businessman as an artist means? Um, most artists really don't like to deal with business matters. I was one like that as well. Uh, for quite a while after I left Mitsugamo for various reasons, I painted on my own. I didn't show really anywhere because I never felt I was good enough. And um, we, you mentioned that uh, Sid Willis you know, got me to uh, show my work in Boston. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to ex exhibit this painting, but I know Mr. Gannon is going to you know, say it's not good enough. And he said, Richard, it's better than anybody else's. Mm. And so I started to... I, I, hate, I hated doing brochures. I hated contacting galleries. I hated, hated doing all of this stuff. Right. Uh, but somebody has to do it. If you're lucky enough to have, uh, have a friend or, or a wife or whatever that will do it for you, that's great. Um, but most of what I've done is on my own. Uh, I find uh, galleries aren't that interested in you if, unless you really do promote your own work, um, and and I think uh, Sam's advice to me, I mean, it uh, it just struck me so true. It's still true. Sure. It's still true. Yeah. Um, I saw a film recently about a modernist artist who did works of art in the landscape itself. And I'm, you know, most of the things that I saw, they, they were, I, I thought it was BS. Right. But once in a while, yes, he did something that was quite interesting. Um, you know, he had a few home runs there. The movie showed a lot of strikeouts, in my view. Sure. But I'm thinking, how did this man, he's got five kids, how is he making a living? Um, I have no idea. Mm. I don't I have no idea how he did it. I think he came from money. Right. And I see that as happening with some other artists out there, classical painters that are doing very well. They've either married into money or coming from money. Yeah, right. Uh, where some a few others out there who got married um, have become very good businessmen and they're doing well. Sure, sure. You know, it's funny, Richard, uh, many years ago, I uh, was uh, speaking with one of uh, one of my prior art lecturers, and um, as, a, as a homework task, one thing that he set for us was to uh, to go out and find rich parents. <laughs> uh, yes, um, well, yes, that's the, well, that's the idea. Um, it's, uh, I didn't find them anyway. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, speaking of Mr. Rose... I understand Mr. Gamma would oftentimes send you both to the opera and theatre to listen to shows such as Madame Butterfly and Carmen. At your age, did you appreciate these shows and have you found them to be benef beneficial uh, to your work as a painter? Well, absolutely, I appreciated them. Um, I listened to opera and so forth long before Gamma took, took us to the opera. He seems to have forgotten that I minored in music. Mm. That I knew, I knew actually more about music than he did, um, and I still. Uh, beautiful music is very inspiring. It very is listening to uh, uh, Mozart or Handel or Schubert while I'm painting something uh, is very helpful as far as helping me to concentrate on the painting itself, to be encouraged by it, to feel in a beautiful. Night in a, in a good mood, sure, and sure. and try to try to express that mood on the canvas, right. So I think yes, music, poetry, these other things are beneficial. They do make you more sensitive, sure. And I think I think great artists are extremely sensitive people. That's true. Moving on, we've come to understand that you are a distinguished portrait and landscape painter. These are two different genres of painting which present varying challenges. Portrait painting is a struggle to capture the likeness of the sitter. However, it appeals to people 
as a subject is a human being which for many would be far more psychologically interesting than a landscape. On the other hand, with landscape painting, you are constantly chasing light effects and battling the elements of nature. Landscape seems to be more of a mature painter's genre and as such doesn't seem to appeal to the new age painters coming up in the tradition. In saying this, do you find that your figurative work uh, has aided your landscape work and vice versa? Well, first of all, I would respectfully disagree with you a little bit. I do know of many young landscape painters out here that are, are doing great work. Um, there will always be a love for landscape painting. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, yes, uh, there are a lot of new age painters that are, are dealing with figurative subjects, uh, imaginative subjects, so on and so forth. And um, that is also, you know, very important. Um, the figurative work uh, basically helped me to train my eye to see shape and form, you know, shape and shadow and so forth. Sure. That's aided. Sure. That's aided me in landscape. My landscape work has helped me refine my eye for color, and that's helped me when I'm painting the figure, right? The portrait. Digressing back to Mr. Gamble, as we have come to learn, those involved in the revival of traditional picture making understand that Mr. Gamble was one of the most affluent artist teachers of the 20th century for he passed on the principles and methods of representational painting to his students, who in turn have become the leading disseminators of traditional painting throughout the world today. In 2008, he began the important work of transcribing all of Mr. Gamble's letters, which were addressed to yourself and your parents, which you published into a book this year titled Advice to a Young Artist, Letters from Ives Gamble to Richard Whitney. This book gives us insight into Mr. Gamble's philosophy on art, a painter's trading, cultivating a sensibility, and Mr. Gamble's life in general, as well as his notorious personality. These notes are essentially ideas passed on from master to student over the centuries in order to maintain the traditional standards of painting. You have stated, quote, learning to paint involves learning to see, and guidance from a master craftsman is necessary. This book should be used as a supplement to studio instruction. It can easily fit in a paint box, unquote. When you were collecting Mr. Gamble's letters initially, did you know that one day you would compile them into a book, or was that something that uh, came to you at a later point in your life? I had no idea that I'd compile them into a book. It came to me last year out of the blue. Wow, okay. Yep. Now, you mentioned that the book has been received fairly well. Um, and it's Yes, it's been very well received. I've had a lot of co positive comments on it. Fantastic. Any uh, any negative criticism? No, not so far. Good. That's great. You have also published another book before the aforementioned one, which is titled Painting the Visual Impression. The book's genesis lays in the fact that Mr. Gamble asked his students to keep notes of his comments and critiques. You followed Mr. Gamble's advice, and over the years, you have taught your own classes based on these notes. I understand the notes were collected in your notebook, which you maintained during your studies with Mr. Gamel. However, the notes were almost lost when one night after finishing a class with Mr. Gamel, you unconsciously left the book on the roof of your car. After driving for 40 miles, you became conscious of what had happened. The story goes that you began driving back and forth in the dark, searching for the book until 4 a.m. in the morning when you happened to spot it on the side of the road. It's incredible to think that these important notes came so close to not being published. Can you elaborate somewhat on this interesting night? Well, I was certainly in a panic. I mean, uh, I realized what I had done. Uh, it, was, it was just disastrous because that book contained virtually everything that he had talked to me about painting-wise that I was able to write down at the time. And... Uh, I just decided I just went back and forth hours back and forth for the searching for the book and I finally found it um, uh, in the ditch near the road uh, it was a miracle that I found it really <laughs> that's incredible was anybody with you or you were on your own looking for no it? I was on I was on my own Wow your notes were first printed in 1979 
In 1995, Pat and Jeff Jurd first published them into book form with black and white illustrations of your paintings. Several years later, you produced a full color version and in 2018, you spent six weeks revising the book further. It has since been read by countless artists and is considered a comprehensive text on the principle of painting. In fact, the acclaimed realist painter, Daniel Green, stated, quote, it is on par with the classic, The Art Spirit by Robert N. Rye, and is destined to be a classic book on portraiture and painting, unquote. You had this to say about the book, quote, Although I have written this book for other artists, anyone with an interest in art can read it and greatly increase their appreciation and understanding of classical realism. Can you explain more about the journey of writing the book and how you believe it is different to other books concerning the technicalities of traditional realist painting? Well, most uh, books on painting uh, deal with how that particular artist works. Uh, what colors he uses, what brushes he uses, what medium he uses, how he stretches his canvas, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that has nothing to do with how, how one thinks about painting. The general ideas that you need to follow, such as the silhouette of the masses is, is your design. And, and you need to make that silhouette as interesting as possible, and that improves your composition. That's the central idea, not what type of canvas you use, what type of charcoal you use. Uh, that's irrelevant. Sure. Um, uh, all, all the great artists of the world had, uh, had palettes or used different colors and palettes, different materials, or they'd all look the same. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it'd be a boring wor world if everybody's paintings looked the same. Sure. Now, can I ask Richard as well, when you uh, were publishing your book, uh, Painting the Visual Impression, was that based on perhaps a book that you had come across in your own uh, study as a painter that had really helped you, or was it just entirely based on uh, your, your observations from Mr. Gamble's teaching? It was, it was based mostly on my observations from Mr. Gamble's teaching, as well as uh, many books that I had written on painting that, and passages from those books that I thought were important. Sure. Moving on. You ended your training with Mr. Gamble on the 12th of August 1970. In 1979, you sent him excerpts from your notes, which he oftentimes harshly criticized. In fact, the last time you ever saw Mr. Gamble was, a criticism, was during a criticism of your writing where he openly stated that you were, quote, wasting your time, unquote. As he left that day, you had an overwhelming sense that you would never see him again. Can you recall more about this last meeting? Well, uh, yes. He, uh, we sat down and, and he went over maybe three or four pages of my notes uh, saying this is good here, that's no good there, change this thing here, uh, so on and so forth. And he got tired and he eventually said, that's it, I've had it. Uh, nobody's ever learned how to paint by reading a book. You're wasting your time. And... You know, as I was about to leave, he smiled at me, and when he smiled at me, I had an overwhelming sense I would never see him again, and I had all, I had all I could do not to burst out crying. Okay. Because you know, I I have such had such and do have still such ambivalent feelings about this man. Mm. Uh, I I owe him my life. Yeah, he also did things to me that were not uh, very good. Um, a mixture. And uh, I just uh, basically overwhelming love for him. Sure. I've come to that, I've come to that conclusion. Um, I've kept criticism of him basically out of my book. I didn't go into detail with things as I've done in this interview. I wanted his words to speak for themselves. Um, because he's not here to defend himself. I, I thought I would take myself out of the equation as much as possible. Sure. Now that smile that he, uh, he gave you as you were walking out, uh, what, what do you think that meant? Oh, he still loved me. Uh, still uh, you know, loved or liked me a lot, whatever you might say. 
Uh, he still had feelings for me, cared about me as a as a painter and as a person. Um, he probably had a somewhat fun tear me down as before. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I sensed that warmth in him that, you know, so much of the time he could be just the most charming individual. And then out of the blue, he could explode when you say something about this or that that he doesn't agree with or whatever. I mean, you never knew when that uh, uh, person, that, that negative side of him came out. Sure. I, I, I call it gamolitis. Yeah, right. Gamolitis, and I've spent a good time, a good bunch of my time in my life trying to get rid of it. Sure. Now, Richard, prior to this meeting, uh, had you seen Gamma often, or was it quite an extended break? No. Okay. No, this, this was after the break. Uh, this is the first time I'd seen him in probably nine years. Wow. Nine years. That's incredible. Yeah. I had written to him a few times, uh, and, and it was the usual, you know, criticisms of my painting uh, portraits after I painted my uh, Sandy, the le man with the leather jacket. Mm. He, never, he never mentioned my portrait painting again. Uh, he started in on my writing, writing ability. Mm. And yes, uh, much of what he criticized was right. But then instead of saying, yep, just keep working on it, you know, and, and it's like, oh, you're wasting your time. Mm. You know, that, that's the sort of negative part that I, I, I didn't like. I, thought, I felt it was not a waste of my time. It was very important that I try to record for history as much of what Mr. Gamble taught me, word for word, if possible, as I could. Sure. Moving on. I understand you are co-author of the book Realism in Revolution, The Art of the Boston School. Can you tell me what your contributions to the book were? I wrote a chapter on the principles of painting. So essentially summarizing what I later put in a book, uh, that was my first effort to try to really put it all together. Sure. Do you plan on writing more books in the future? Uh, yes. Um, I'm working on a book of my portrait paintings. Uh, I think it might be helpful to my dealers and so forth as far as sending these things out to future clients. Um, most, of my, most of the paintings that I've done have been commissioned work or with my, with my landscapes, they have been sold. Very few have been publicly exhibited. So the general public doesn't know much about my work. Right. Uh, they've, know, they've heard my name and so forth, but they haven't really seen much. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would write a book with my experiences on painting some of the portraits that I have. Sure. And then I, then I would write another book on my landscape painting and eventually hopefully combine those two into one uh, tabletop book would be a, a dream. Mm -hmm. But I, who knows if I'll live to see it. Right, right. Now, is, is, writing, uh, is working on these books writing something that you're doing uh, simultaneously when you're painting? Or is it more, you know, one day you're working on your paintings and one day you might be working on your book? Um, that, that approach, uh, not simultaneously. Sure. The following quote eloquently describes your views on the craft of painting. Quote, there's an awful lot of work involved. But if you go past the labor, you get an ecstasy part where you walk in and you get the final brush strokes and you're really proud. You realize it's a really good painting. It makes you feel good. If you're working in a landscape and you're able to capture the beauty that's out there and you know it, it's really a profound experience. I hope when they look at my work, they will see that the world is a beautiful place, can be a beautiful place. I hope that my work gives them a sense of joy, happiness, peace. I agree with Renoir who said, there is enough ugliness in the world, why create more? And I think for me personally, a painting is a way to create beauty or express the beauty of what you see and to give that beauty to other people. So it's very, very important to me 
when I hear from clients and the collectors how much they love my work and how much it has meant to them over the years. I mean, that's what I live for." Unquote. This is a lovely passage and one really gets a sense for your passion of the craft. At this point in your life, do you feel as though you have peaked as a painter? That is to say, do you believe that your best work has already been created or do you think you still have more work to do? Well, I still think I have more work to do, I hope. Um, I will say that here I am now 73. Uh, I don't have the energy I had when I was 33 or 43 or 53. Um, so that's going to affect what I do. Um, I think my role now is also as a teacher, a writer, and not just a painter. Um, but once in a while, I still dream of doing another great painting, and I have some ideas in mind and hope at some point in time to be able to do that. Sure. So do you feel as though teaching is becoming more of an important part of your life as you're getting older? Oh, it's always been important, but writing about it is, is the thing now. Mm -hmm. Preserve, pre preserving it for posterity. Absolutely. And, and really what you're doing there is following... In the, in the footsteps of your predecessors. I mean, Mr. Gamble, uh, he wrote on painting. Mr. Lack wrote on painting. It's a very necessary part of your teaching, I believe. Uh, absolutely. Throughout your life, you have undoubtedly seen the art of traditional representational painting come back with a vengeance, something that Mr. Gamble never lived to see. What is your opinion on the current state of traditional representational painting today? Well, I think it's very hopeful. Um, even 20 years ago, I would not have believed the uh, renaissance in representational painting, how many young artists are pursuing it. I think uh, something uh, Fred Ross in the Art Renewal Center had a lot to do with it, uh, publicizing the work of realist painters, letting the rest of the art world know that they're out there. Uh, Join, uh, joining the organization, the Art Renewal Center, getting accredited by them, uh, showing your work on that website. I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I think it's a great thing that Fred has done. Sure. And are you networking with other artists in New Hampshire, Richard? Uh, from time to time. Not very often, but I do see other artists occasionally, yes. Sure. Where do you see your work going in the future? I, I would like to do some more major landscape work. Um, uh, obviously, I'd like some more portrait commissions because I make a lot of money at the portraiture. That's how I make my living. But with landscape painting, there's a certain freedom I get. And I, I became a painter partly because I love color. Mm. And in, in landscape painting, nature's colors are just overwhelming. Um, they excite. They excite me. I mean, nature is the greatest artist. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Approaching the end of the interview, in the last few pages on your book on Mr. Gamble's notes, you close by stating, "Quote: Despite the challenges, the success I have had as a painter, I owe to Eyes Gamble, and I will do it again in a heartbeat." Unquote. You seem to have some closure on the issues you faced with Mr. Gamble. If there was some way that you could go back in time to have one last truthful heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him, what do you think you would say? Well, I would say, I would hope he would say that uh, what I would say is I, I hope that uh, my work uh, met his standards. Um, I hope that my writing was, was up to his standards. Uh, I hope that he was proud of me. Um, I don't know if he would have been. I have no idea. Mm. Would you be looking for perhaps an apology from him? That would be wonderful. Uh, but I doubt that that would happen. I, do, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, um, I don't know if he's capable of apologizing. He was just so insistent. Uh, he was just so strong-willed. Um, I, as I think, I, I think he mellowed with age. But when I saw him, he was the old gamble I knew. Uh, and then he smiled at me, and that was sort of 
you know, the smile and sort of having fun, uh, the, the, the loving man that he was. Um, as I said, I think he, he mellowed with age. I would hope he would say some very positive things about me now. Sure. So the last memory you have of Mr. Gamel is that, that smile as you're walking out of that meeting. Yes. After reading all your letters from Mr. Gamel, there is one in particular that especially resonated with me, the content of which is Mr. Gamel giving a younger you invaluable advice on your life as a painter. In conclusion, I would like to read the letter in which Mr. Gamel wrote you on February 18, 1966. Dear Richard, I am genuinely touched by your having taken me into your confidence and I wish I were better equipped to give you intelligent counsel. My particular experience of life limits me to those who share my interests devote to, devoted to painting. To most of us who were born so minded, there is no doubt as to what we would do in life and from a very early age our dedication to painting is complete and unquestioning. No doubt that gives us a rather special outlook which though not uncommon, is certainly not universal. Nothing in the predicament you describe as yours is out of the ordinary, and you have at your disposal exceptional advantages for working it out. Your lucidity about yourself is one of the greatest of these. So is the fact that you do not have to make any immediate decisions. In the nature of things unforeseeable events will bring you new factors into your life which will change you for better or worse according to the way you respond to them. I have little doubt but that your response will be the only, the one only best suited for your development. Sooner or later, for instance, the girl will turn up who arouses your deeper nature and suddenly your entire attitude will be reversed. Instead of weighing and comparing, wondering whether or not she is the girl that you care to select, you will be carried away by something so much bigger than yourself that all your thoughts will be how to make yourself worthy of her. This is the common experience of manhood. Whether the urge to paint gives you a comparable experience is something else. To some people it does, enlisting all their facilities and drives so that the question ceases to exist whether painting is a suitable or convenient job. I do not say that either or both are capable of wiping out all your present doubts and vanities and in a sense make happiness for its own sake seem irrelevant. This is simply the wisdom of the ages, something known as corn, but it is not the less true. You have doubtless seen, you have doubtless been often told that written in letters in gold over the door of the temple of Delphi were the words, Know thyself. Its fame is due to its immense wisdom, but as we all know, the commandment is difficult indeed to carry out. Still, the effort can be rewarding. You may find that your difficulty in settling down to read is simply due to your lack of interest in what the books have to offer. Perhaps there is nothing in your nature that responds to great literature. Conceivably, there never will be. This is something for you to discover. I had known innumerable people who say that they love books but just can't find the time to read. I have no patience for that sort of self-depiction. If literature is beyond you, has no message for you, face that as a fact of life. I would also examine why it is that you do not have friends, if such is the case, who know and care and talk about such things. I owe more to my friends than to any other one thing in my life. There certainly must be boys in your class with good minds and fine intelligence, but I have never heard you mention the existence of such. And to close with one last ear of corn, let me add that old saw that what a young person really wants in life he will probably get. I was told this when I was a kid. I have read it in books and lo, I've seen it happen too. But you have got to really want it. Want it steadily and generally and keep on wanting it. And working for it. Emerson, I think it was, said that it was so true that we got what we wanted in that way that we have better careful to want only the high things. If you want petty things, you will be equally sure to end up with this instead. Sincerely, Eyes Gamble. What incredibly rich advice. This letter must have really touched you. Uh, yes. I mean, the, the last two paragraphs especially. Um, I mean, this is just one of 
many, many letters that he wrote that uh, just knocked me over when I read them. And I said, my God, I've got to publish these. Mm. They're just too good. Even if, even, uh, I, even if I, some of the letters that he wrote to me were about personal matters uh, dealing with me, I felt that the rest of the letters were so important that I, was, I just lay, lay myself bare before the world. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I let, him, I let him talk to me about what he thought about me and so forth without t- answering back to the reader my viewpoints. Sure. Uh, um, there, were, there was so much. You, you should read the letters to Mr. Gamble as though they're written to you, mm-hmm. you know, the, re- the reader, and get what you can out of them. Um, underlying passages that are particularly strong, strong and so forth. Um, Yes, incredibly rich advice, and and I felt the had to be made public. Sure, sure. Just reading over that last uh, passage as well, as a young man, that must have really given you a, a sense of direction and a way to go about facing perhaps some of the issues that you were dealing with at that particular time in your life. You know, ab- absolutely. I mean, I I think we got closer to each other in letters than we actually did face to face. Um, whenever I was with Mr. Gamble, I was just so in awe, awe of him that I was, I wasn't that comfortable. I was always a little bit on ease, uh, at ease. Um, you know, I just admired him so much. And at the same time, as time went on, uh, the atmosphere, uh, grew less encouraging. And I realized I had to leave. I, I remember, uh, um, Dean Martin and uh, Jerry Lewis. Uh, Jerry Lewis has remarked the two greatest days of my life were the day that I met Dean Martin and the day I left him. Wow. And I feel the same way. I mean, uh, uh, this was a great human being who not only touched me and, and several other students, but people like Richard Lack, who went on to teach literally over 100 artists who are practicing today. I mean, that's a great achievement. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think now is the time for Mr. Gamble, his reputation to be known. He should be known as a major figure of the 20th century. I agree with that. And as well, when I read over your letters uh, from Mr. Gamble, Richard, you know, I can't help but think of Theo Van Gogh and Vincent Van Gogh. I mean, they, they were brothers. It's a bit yeah, different. Yes, absolutely. But, um, very, very much a kind of a similar nature. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought of that. But yes, uh, I read uh, Dear Theo, his, his letters. I was, you know, when I was a young art student, and it was very, very profoundly in, uh, influenced by them. Um, you know, art is in my blood. Um, it will always be there. If, if I'm not painting for a week or more, I start getting very depressed. I have to paint. Mm-hmm. I understand, Mr. Gamble, is, is in your is in your bones. It's deep in your bones, and the other thing, never give up. Just keep going. I mean, that is so important. Um, that when Mr. Gamble would tell me, "Oh, you're wasting your time. Don't don't write about art," uh, I didn't give up. I decided I'm going to write about it. His ideas and the ideas that uh, other artists before him were, were so important. I had to put them down on paper. Because I don't think anybody, I don't think anyone has put it down concisely in a book before I have. Sure. Is there anything else you would like to mention or perhaps revisit before we end? Uh, just that I'm greatly admire what you are doing you know, to preserve uh, the the craft and interest in traditional painting. Uh, to inspire young people to continue the tradition, uh, to co- record history. Um, I'm Mr. Gamble's age now. I'm sort of like the last, I'm the next generation to go. Um, you know, I, I want to leave something behind. I want to leave something behind me when I go. And you've helped me leave one more aspect of myself behind. No one has ever given me an extensive interview before, and I'm most grateful for it. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Richard. It's been been absolutely my pleasure. And I, I suppose as well, you know, one thing that I want to communicate. I mean, as, as you've uh, you know, you're, you're entering your old age and, and such. I mean, there was no there's no it's no possibility that I could have could go back in time and and study with the greats like Mr. Gamble or Mr. Lack. But you know what what we have today is we have we have you and your colleagues. You know, the, the first generation or sec, second generation of Mr. Gamble students uh, who we can learn from. So I just wanted to say thank you for all of your efforts in writing about uh, in, about painting, in painting itself and in, in teaching, and especially for the book on your letters uh, from Mr. Gamble. That has, been, give, that has given me so much insight into what it was actually like to be back there in the, the, uh, the, the early years of, of the, uh, the Fenway Studios and uh, in Williamstown, Massachusetts, painting the landscape. Um, so again, I just want to say thank you so very much for all of your efforts, sir. And you're you're very welcome. Again, uh, I'm I'm just delighted and very honored to be here, and I greatly appreciate what you are doing. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Richard. Now, before we conclude, would you like to provide your contact information so that listeners can get in touch with you? Uh, sure. It's uh, 100 Chalet Drive. That's C H A L E T Drive, Stoddard, S T O D D A R D, New Hampshire, 03464. My website is www.crescentpond.com. C R E S C E N T P O N D.com. And uh, my email address is studios, S-T-U-D-I-O-S, the at sign, crescentpond.com, C-R-E-S-C-E-N-T-P-O-N-D.com. So I'd love to hear from any listeners. Don't, don't be afraid to contact me. That's how I got started in all this. I determined I was going to contact the great master, Mr. Gamble, and ask the man what do I do? How would I learn how to paint? Don't be afraid to contact me. I won't bite. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard. You take care, and I'll uh, thank you again for an amazing interview. Thank you so much. You okay. take care as well. No worries now. Take care now, Richard. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.